Good lunchtime, good evening, wherever in this nice, nice world you are. My name is Axel Deike. I am the chairman of this industry connection group, nurturing the era of end-to-end -end mobility as a service, standards for connected and autonomous transportation activities. Please to the next. Christina, go to the next. Okay. Just to give you some background, we are on a, is it a workshop? Uh, we would love to hear, to hear your involvement. So please, whenever you have questions, come up. The whole session is going to be recorded. If you don't agree to the recording, then please mention it or we have to take you out. Uh, in case there are any questions, please forward it by the chat window, which is down about in the middle. Just click chat and forward your question whenever it comes up. Uh, when there are questions, we will usually do it in the end of the sessions of the presentations. But if you feel it could be, should be discussed immediately, then just mention it. And we might ask you to forward your question yourself, including <coughs> your picture, if you like to, to show us. The next, please. So that's me. I am. Uh, working in the automotive industry since 40 years. I start, I studied electric electronics in Munich at the Technical University and joined BMW. I worked at BMW for 33 years. And since 2012, I am a consultant on my own, uh, doing all kind of support jobs for the worldwide industry. Uh, if I say worldwide, means, for example, China, United States, and so on. So this is my, my personal favor, really, to bring the world together. Uh, last year, IEEE, in name Hermann Brandt, who is with us today as well, who is the leader of the European setup of the IEEE, asked me, uh, to create or to forward, uh, to continue uh, a line of workshops uh, with uh, around automotive industry. And we created this industry connection forum. And I would like to underline really, it's a, it's a forum. Whenever you have ideas, whatever should be discussed, please come up with it, it should be an open global forum. That's the idea. The, this program here now is, was the first try. First, we had our uh, cybersecurity webinar, which was on the 4th of February, if I'm right. And you see on the right side, the program committee. So we have BMW involved, Fujitsu, Unisec, AW, AW, AVL, sorry, <laughs> uh, Bosch and NVIDIA. So go to the next, please. So this is what we have prepared. We are going through step by step. There is going to be a coffee break at 14.30 CET European time. Uh, whatever time it is for our attendees. Uh, in case there are questions, please forward immediately and uh, we will try to incorporate it into the presentation even maybe. So next, please. So the first idea is to give us a wider overview what trustworthiness as a key enabler in the connected services mobility world means. And this is going to be presented by Jürgen Neises from Fujitsu and Thomas Woloszke. Why this is an old version? Sorry, Thomas, we missed your SecuCon background here for whatever reason. Jürgen is a senior consultant working at Fujitsu Technology Solutions since 20 years. 
He is as well coordinating the EU project uh, Horizon in Europe. Uh, I'm sure he will mention that and elaborate a little bit more on that. Before he worked at Nixdorf as a scientist in, in the scientific world, world, he studied in Switzerland, St. Gallen, as well as RVTH Aachen on numer numerical simulation models. Thomas is leading the Deutor Cybersecurity Solutions. He, is the founder of the Second Trust Consult Company as well. And before he worked for something like 20 years with Fujitsu as well on security solutions. Uh, both are going to share the presentation. I don't know who's going to start. I think Jürgen, yours, the stage is yours. Yes, thanks Axel. Yeah. Uh... Today we will present some results from the Horizon 2020 uh, funded project Secure IoT, uh, which was uh, initiated by Fujitsu, uh, especially by ideas based from uh, Thomas and me. Uh, we both have coordinated the Fujitsu activities in Horizon 2020, and nowadays I'm coordinating these activities uh, of Fujitsu in Horizon Europe. So uh, within this project Secure IoT, um, we started from the idea um, of trustworthiness as a part of it. Uh, originating from Industry 4.0 and other uh, topics, we observe a rising uh, discussion on trustworthiness itself, especially in the context of autonomous uh, systems or even cognitive systems. So for example, connected or even autonomous vehicles. So today we present a modular, flexible, and pragmatic approach towards automated trustworthiness evolution, evaluation. Sorry, and this approach has been developed, as said before, in uh, as part of the Horizon 2020 funded project Secure IoT. It started in 2018 and ended uh, in December last year, and is currently subject uh, to review by the European Commission. So. Thomas, if you would like to say some oh, more words. Thank you. Me. Thank you all. Hello, my name is Thomas. And I will continue speaking about Secure IoT, which tackles security of industrial IoT and autonomous systems by an AI and data-driven approach. So what we are speaking about is based on data probes, common security knowledge, uh, on vulnerabilities, AI analytics, engines, and such a kind of stuff everybody knows today. These findings uh, support uh, at the end for security as a service implementations, which are known as a risk assessment, compliance auditing, programming support, and security knowledge base. So at the end, these are the basic uh, functions in our project. And we had three different use cases. One of them is the multi vendor industry 4.0, which is linked to uh, things, IoT platforms like MindSphere or social assistive robots, which are used in uh, healthcare for autistic children and uh, the main important point for today is connected cars and autom uh, autonomous uh, driving, which is uh, linked uh, to existing uh, background cloud systems. And now oh, we yeah, present... I, I still see the first page, so don't forget ah. the next slide, please. No, no, it's exactly now. Let me uh, continue now. We present uh, how uh, trustworthiness facilitates secure edge in cloud communication. Next, please. Thank you. So uh, first let's illustrate the situation. 20, uh, 125 million cars with embedded connectivities are expected to be on the road in 2022. So a third of vehicle models will have built-in over-the-air software updates and cybersecurity is critical to mitigate safety risks. This is the uh, situation. Considering these numbers, we have to understand that cars need to be secured uh, uh, with, the, with the idea of cross-entity communication inside 
uh, the factory among uh, IoT components and inside the cars as well. This is a trivial request to speak about security, but what does it mean from our point of view? And the following, we illustrate our approach, model and application related to the industry. So speaking about the uh, autonomous car uh, requirements, this is a major requirement for manufacturers, for example, in, uh, of cars and the operator of users of cars and the car reliability, which fulfills that and only that what is specified, ordered and expected, nothing else. This is one of the most important security requirements we can uh, describe. And this is the requisite of a trust, especially in autonomous systems. So therefore we see the need and it's our goal in security to create a system for measurable trustworthiness, keeping potential security related incident as low as possible. Our focus is really on trustworthiness to measure. So at the end, uh, we speak about details to objectives in this task, namely create transparency in the area of trustworthiness, derive concrete steps to create a trust model or trust models, create automatic verifiable processes down to the machine or component level, especially in communication. We outline we <clears throat> how to tackle these objectives in the, uh, in the presentation. Next, please. Now let's start with the idea of what is trustworthiness and what is the trustworthiness concept itself. There is not one single answer in the world. There are many perceptions of trustworthiness available. However, if we want to develop a useful system, we need to align to the most relevant aspects. Trustworthiness often is defined as the rather abstract and contextual way to, uh, by various stakeholders in the industrial internet of con uh, internet consortium, for example, you see in the beginning of the uh, on the right side, or platform industry 4.0, or the robot revolution initiative of Japan. If you look to these definitions, you will find they are nearly speaking about the same things, but they are using different words. And so you can see different ideas maybe behind that. But on the left side, you will find something important coming from Germany. There is a, there is a figure illustrating the concept of what should be considered in, in trustworthiness by the German VDA described in the application guideline VDA uh, 2842261 dealing with autonomous and cognitive systems. The concept itself was developed by the German VDA, uh, which is the Verbanter Elektrotechnik, which is the Association for Electrical and Electronic Information Technologies in collaboration with Fortis to Research Institutes, Institute uh, of the German Federal State of Bavaria. If you look to these definitions, which is possibly clear now, a lot of different definitions can be defined and we have to follow one of them. At the end, our goal is um, to speak about global uh, requirements like we have in global legal entity identifiers described to identify a, a company. And uh, if we have such kinds of definitions, uh, then we can create a special uh, uh, technology, which will be described afterwards. We call them characteristics of what, what kind of characteristics are describing trustworthiness. So please, Jürgen. Next slide, please. With this slide, we illustrate what we have developed uh, in security. Uh, it's an approach to close the gap between the model, the ideas of uh, which have been described in the slide before, and uh, finding some uh, concrete steps towards a trust model which is feasible to support the automated calculation and the automated evaluation of trustworthiness at any time and possibly close to real time. This approach is based on the uh, trustworthiness model of the Industrial Internet Consortium, IIC. This, the IIC system characteristics include safety. This can include, uh, for example, time synchronized low latency services, 
reliability, resilience, which is closely linked to availability, robustness, and maintainability, privacy, which is also linked to ethics. These characteristics on their own represent domain-specific expectations and policies. So the, we need to consider a kind of attribution or configuration of these characteristics. So weighted measurable attributes contribute to the degree of fulfillment of the expectations. Within this model, we consider that the characteristics itself keep interdependencies during their own on the level of sharing at some attributes with the same semantics. So you could also consider one characteristics on its own and one characteristics for, uh, by uh, the next one. So it's not um, considered that, they, that we need to focus on interdependencies between the characteristics, we should focus on themselves. With this uh, universal model, we need to configure it as said before to the application domain be it industry 4.0, automotive, or mobility in general. This configuration includes the selections of the characteristics as illustrated before with the VDE model and the definition of the attributes which we need. And these attributes should be based on standards or best practices. And certainly we need to configure the properties, the ranges of constraints, which we um, need to say some of the requirements are fulfilled. So minimum properties, maximum properties, and target properties we should uh, define. These uh, constraints can uh, define the range of operation, define the range how we can compare if some entity which we want to communicate to or with are, can be evaluated as trustworthy in terms of one characteristics. If the mandatory or lowest uh, scale isn't fulfilled, the entity shouldn't be considered being trustworthy. So the glue, which glues everything together, will be uh, standards and best practices, as I said before. So configure, configuring such a model for the automotive world of a uh, mobility uh, application uh, would use standards like ISO SIA 21434, the ISO TC 204, or usually the ISO uh, 27001, and it should include some stuff like the NISA recommendations. Next slide, please. Here we want to illustrate or outline how we uh, computed and aggregated quantifiable metrics. We have several parts of metrics. We have device-based metrics. For example, if you have a machine or some module, this they have static um, attributes, static properties. So the manufacturer of the model, of the um, module, its firmware version, model number, etc. These usually do not change fast. So they, are in, they could can be considered as uh, some static part, which defines the device, potential vulnerabilities, etc. These parts need to be weighted as a part of a security characteristics or another one. So we can take these things also for other metrics, but uh, let's focus on the security one. Then the, the parts or modules communicate among each other. So we can consider the protocol they use, the, uh, the certificate issuers. This is changing a bit more dynamic than uh, the device metric itself. And finally, we have a metrics based on the behavior, network presence, activity, forwardings, message destinations, etc. This is highly dynamic. So we have several weighted parts which can which contribute to the metrics of uh, one characteristics and we have several uh, different par, uh, different ways to uh, analyze these for example we have a classical weighting uh, components like in the device metrics in the communication metrics we could uh, apply typical cryptographic criteria and the behavioral metrics could be uh, evaluated, for example, based on AI. So each part can contribute with some weight to the characteristic. 
co-evaluation. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I will continue speaking about what we did. Of course, we had to implement a, a, a demo and we have to show that this uh, is working. And the background, we are, uh, uh, we are now speaking about the background of uh, connected cars. So there are two uh, connections to be discussed. One is car to car and one is car to cloud. And at the end, why should I trust a connection coming from another car? Uh, it's another question uh, is, uh, connecting to the cloud, but in principle, the same uh, background. And uh, what we are now speaking about is the implementation of trustworthiness evaluation, which can be completely uh, living in an edge or partially cloud-based. So a car, of course, has the power to calculate the critical parts itself. Uh, in our case here, we have two different cars. Uh, each is monitoring its own standard sensoring. So it's uh, absolutely independent, uh, uh, which, um, car it, uh, type it shall be or will be. This sensor, datas, uh, this sensor data readings are analyzed locally and used uh, and using special uh, specialized components. So it's not uh, um, bound to what we have at sensors at the moment. If we need more, all these sensors can be understood by the onboard unit. Um, an edge deployed AI algorithm is used for trend prediction and anomaly detection. Uh, this is uh, done by uh, not only observing the, uh, the environment, it's the car itself. So it's uh, um, permanently observing the car technology itself. It reports the system's behavior to be trust to calculate a trustworthiness scoring. So this car knows something about its own uh, security scorings. Um, another component of installation is customized, is, is, is a customized probe called a secure IoT probe. We are using in secure IoT special probes. The probe services uh, uh, to relay system states information for the uh, um, trustworthiness engine and the published data comprises of network connections, hardware, runtime data, and it reports connection and device specific metrics. This is the background of how the systems know something about it, each other. And now the trustworthiness, a special trustworthiness engine comprises the trustworthiness evaluation services and the policy decision, uh, uh, policy decision points. So at the end, which is not discussed here today is behind all this we need of course compliance and uh, 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 compliance rules and of course uh, um, networks of understanding each, each other worldwide otherwise this will not work um, in our case um, this is for information um, um, will be used uh, um, in the kind of trustworthiness spider chart you will see on the right side. And we will compare uh, minimum and maximum requirements and if uh, requirements will be fulfilled. For example, the security value is required to be high. So at least, for example, in this case, 70%. This is, of course, a number which can be changed in kind of rule sets. And the current requester is uh, rated uh, of having a, a security value of 60%, so the requirement is not fulfilled. So at the end, these both cars don't trust each other. In such a case, the requesting service needs to be adjust its behavior if uh, this is not true, or you have to change the, uh, the, the ratings in your uh, compliance rules, or you have to change the technology in place and uh, something is wrong in the situation now. So you have to, to react in the system behind that. So what we show here is we permanently observe the sur surroundings to find out if we can tr uh, trust each other. Next, please. And Jürgen. Thanks, Thomas. Well, uh, within Secure IoT, we demonstrated in a relevant environment that the described model and 
term first approach to metrics of trustworthiness is an effective measure to control access to devices based on trust and ensure only communications with trustworthiness and trustworthy entities. However, uh, as it has been a research project, there is some uh, way to go for a real uh, productive system and uh, there are some open topics to be solved in uh, the next steps and to facilitate a broad uptake of trustworthiness as a common tool. So we need some work regarding to uh, the, uh, the sets of catalogs of the characteristics and related attributes. So which of these characteristics are really important and how do we want to define them or configure them? Uh, our proposal is to start small in a, in a on, in a new project with a one domain, for example, mobility or if, or example, industry 4.0, and to extend it to generic catalogs, which enable entities to implement their own uh, policies and evaluation strategies based on weightings, uh, parts of the catalogs and uh, configuration of the metrics. Then we need to align those catalogs uh, across different domains and different local uh, areas and the catalogs should origin or should base on common information security management catalogs in the first step so that we have a, a clear thing uh, to start with, for example, based on ISO 27001 and then going to the domain specific standards. However, these, uh, the translation from standards to technical and configuration uh, parameters still is a challenging task. Next point is, uh, as we said before, we have some modules deployed uh, in the um, autonomous system on here, the car, and the, we need to improve the efficiency of the evaluation modules. So, and uh, then finally, the role of trustworthiness in the quality assessment in a, uh, as a kind of a trust chain from producing the car to operation the, uh, of the car uh, should be assessed and designed. That uh, would be covering the complete chain and uh, we see secure the findings of secure IoT are just the first proposal uh, for a concrete journey uh, to obtain um, the real value of trustworthiness in practice. Next slide please. So, however, what, did, what are the conclusions of this uh, research project, Secure IoT, with regards to trustworthiness? If we want to secure interconnected dynamic supply or service change, either in uh, manufacturing or mobility, there is almost no way around trustworthiness as a kind of evaluating security, safety, etc., in a combined manner. An improved trust model and a simplified policy management are imperative for autonomous and co or cognitive systems, especially uh, regarding the approach of the VDA and Fortis. So we see that we need to consider more than just one area or one characteristics in a combined model. The presented approach, model and demo application of secure IoT is a pragmatic uh, way to enable automatic and measurable trustworthiness. It's, it has been demonstrated in a relevant environment and it's proven feasible for further improvement. We also showed that trustworthiness in combination with attribute-based access control is a valid means to control access to resources. So seeing, oh, considering what Thomas presented in the presentation, having these um, spider, or if we need more characteristics, a more complex uh, diagram, we can evaluate this by a policy engine, and we have a visualization for a clear human readable uh, evaluation. Especially more work is needed to bring the findings into a production system and to integrate this with uh, standard information security management, uh, especially uh, for the various domains. Secure IoT has been a first step, but we need to follow these uh, this, uh, with more steps towards an efficient 
an integrated trustworthiness module. The way from our point is rather clear and we shall continue the journey and we are happy if others uh, align with us uh, in the work and trustworthiness and uh, preparing especially this uh, measurable trustworthiness and uh, finding the right way how to build together and configure attributes, properties, etc. to prepare a really valuable contribution to for a safer world. Next slide. Thank you very much, Jürgen. I hope you are so going to be successful, really. <laughs> uh, just some days ago, I picked up that a very similar session as we do it for the automotive world is going to be done for the medical world. Really, the title of the webinar really sounds almost the same like ours. Uh, how do you see the difference between a medical cybersecurity system and uh, cybersecurity in our automotive world? Well, uh, as shown in slide number four, the principal model is uh, applicable to all to any domain. The more important thing is how to configure the model in which domain. As I see in the chat, uh, the current standardization of security for vehicle to vehicle communication. Well, we, uh, this may be a question. In health, there are other uh, standards, other um, policies and regulations. So we need to consider which kind, which part of these policies and regulations can be translated in useful and clearly measurable uh, attributes, and, uh, which properties are really the important things. And that will be a domain specific journey. And unfortunately, this needs interdisciplinary human brain work uh, mm -hmm. to design this. But, and, uh, that will be the major step for the next follow and the following projects. However, it's the nice thing with this schema is, or model is it's really applicable anywhere. It shows the first ideas how we can build such a metrics, but the configuration will be the next maybe tough step. If okay. I can add something, uh, Axel, we use it in the industry as well. Absolutely different requirements, but it's working perfectly. The trick, obviously, is to adjust it uh, properly to the domain, like, yeah. for example, in the aircraft industry, which is maybe uh, easier to be compared with the automotive industry. There are much, there's much more experience over 20, 30, 40, 50 years already what trustworthiness really means, uh, what kind of level do you mean? I understood from your idea here, it's usually, it's relatively. So something, a new software or whatever, new hardware, new device should be better than the old one. But how do we know really? Hmm. You only know after some time. <laughs> well, we Most need to measure some stuff. We need, we need... <laughs> Certainly, it will take some time uh, to finding, for example, new vulnerabilities and new software. But we can cover this time with the behavioral part of the metrics. We can cover uh, this relative stuff with a real-time view on trustworthiness. But it's, it depends. We can, can we can include the classical con common world which we have today with uh, encryption keys certificates. We can uh, include some, let's say, more or less legal parameters based on standards and regulations. That's the, a rather difficult thing to translate them in the configuration. And we can, can include the behavioral part in the metrics. So a metrics can be weighted. We have mandatory criteria which say, okay, if it's not fulfilled, no trust for these characteristics. And then, that, and then we can build, let's say, company profiles, company policies within these metrics or characteristics. So this is the, char the charming part of the model. It's very flexible. It uh, depends on 
uh, the way how you configure it, but the principle is very, very easy. Okay, so we have to go to the next presentation, please. I think, thank you very much, Jürgen and Thomas. You're welcome. So next, please. Okay, next we are going to hear and hopefully see as well Ricardo Mariani. He is very well known in the IEEE world. At the moment, he works as a VP for industry safety at NVIDIA, specifically on the automotive world. Before, he worked at Intel, functional safety, and as well, he is the first VP at, of the IEEE Computer Society and VP for standardization. And uh, many of you might know him uh, giving all his knowledge into the 26262 uh, regulation for the automotive industry. So Ricardo, we had a nice webinar some time ago where the question was really, uh, how are the different approaches all over the world working together uh, in terms of creating uh, yeah, a, a safe world, but hopefully not being garnished with different uh, requirements for the automotive industry in the different regions of this world. Ricardo, your stage. Yeah, so, yeah, hello everybody and many thanks uh, Axel uh, for your introduction. Um, yeah, we can go in the next slide, please. Uh, yes, in the last, uh, uh, it was the 27th of January, we held a very uh, interesting webinar on this, uh, on this topic with more than 100 attendees. So. Uh, the webinar was organized in this way. I gave a bit of an overview of the topic and I like think what's going on in Europe uh, while the other, other speaker, they introduced what's going on in China. This was done by Ms. Yan Zhang and um, a colleague of her and also what's going in the US. And that in that case, the emphasis was also to new technology like to the quantum type of computer Computer, and this was in the V2X ecosystem, and this was done by Dr. Uh, Tiber. So what I will do is to give you a summary of the webinar, including also some of the questions that have been raised by the audience. And we can go in the next slide, please. So um, as already uh, said very well by Jürgen and Thomas, the trust is built by many different aspects. And again, on the left side of the page, you can see what is being introduced by the VDA uh, initiative uh, in which you combine reliability, availability, maintainability and safety, as also is very interesting how safety itself is split between system safety, functional safety and SOTIF and as well the topic of security touch many different aspects like availability of data, integrity of data, and of course the confidentiality of the data. And then you add on top the privacy, usability, ethics, and robustness. Uh, one of the things that was also quite important uh, is that, uh, and going on the right side of the screen, is that there are a lot of interaction uh, and, and very often it's not just a matter of how we model on the interaction but also how we solve them i give you some example of course you will like that especially an autonomous vehicle is available so that you want to have the service every time is required but then you want that that vehicle is also safe and secure so it could be some attacks on security that they affect safety because they may disable some safety mechanism. And on the other end, on safety, you tend to have a lot of redundancies and then you, those redundancy may open a back door for security attacks. As well, you may want to have a car that's safe and secure, but all the mechanisms that you put in place, like for example, again, redundancy, or maybe cryptography, they may slow down the reaction of your car so that the car at the end is not so 
deterministic in time. So those kind of interaction are very critical. It was appeared also in some question of, of the webinar. And again, we believe that one of the key role of the IEEE is to also feed from the bottom uh, uh, with uh, uh, standardization initiative that helps in solving those. For example, the IEEE, uh, we have a special technical uh, community initiative that is uh, defining techniques uh, for reliable, safe, uh, uh, cyber secure, uh, time deterministic system. Um, and we can go in the next slide, please. So uh, to address all those challenges, we have already heard uh, by Jürgen and Thomas, we have a forest of different uh, regulation and standards. Uh, and this is very well represented by this diagram that I took out of the ENISA, ENISA document. So if we start from the bottom, you have somehow general cyber security standard, uh, typically between ISO and IC, including of course, also standard like the ISO 9001 that gives somehow the foundation for some of the processes you need to have in place. Then you have on top the layer related to the B2X. Uh, uh, and here you have a flourishing of standard, of course, uh, from the IEEE point of view, we have the A22.11BD and all the Etsy and the ISO things. And then on top, you have what is very uh, um, dedicated to automotive including some of the standard we have already mentioned in, uh, by, by Jürgen and by Thomas. So one of the discussion that we had at, at, at the webinar was also, okay, how those kind of a standard are related one with the other? Are there risk of overlaps? For example, the requirement in regulation like the one on the R155, is there, is there an alignment with the requirement of the ISO 21434? Mm -hmm. So that is a good question. And we can go in the next slide, please. That is, I think we all understood it's a challenge. Uh, and this is why this initiative uh, uh, that is driven by Axel is very important for that reason. So we have uh, regulations. Uh, here you have somehow an overview of what we discussed in the, in the webinar, the initiative from UN, of course, the uh, underlying standardization from ISO, IEC, SAE, the IEEE, and then on the right side, we have Europe, China, and the US initiative that I will touch. So uh, it's very important that uh, we create a map of all of that identify gaps that may be there and also overlaps. Uh, so I think this is one of the key topic we need to address in this initiative. And we can go in the next slide, please. Uh, I will start to go a bit more in detail on what's going on in Europe. So, um, so in Europe, uh, mainly we have two things. So the existing EU regulation are mainly the UN regulation automotive uh, cybersecurity um, and the EU Cybersecurity Act. As you can hear, uh, as you can read here, uh, what we highlighted in the webinar world is the main requirement is that there are mandatory cybersecurity requirements that need to be there uh, before you uh, register a vehicle. On the other hand, uh, the certification is based on a type approval by an authority that is designated as a technical service. The objective, at least at today, and we discuss in the webinar, this will go to be less uh, or will be go more in the future. So the objective is to impose a, a today a minimum regulatory uh, cybersecurity requirement to assure safety and data uh, protection, especially uh, related to the consumer in the vehicle and its infrastructure. Now, this may change in the future, growing in terms of requirement. We will see. And about the uh, EU Cybersecurity Act, it's similar. In some sense, there is a voluntary certification of product with regard to cybersecurity. Uh, this is not yet uh, um, uh, specific to the automotive sector. 
and it's somehow based, as mentioned, on a self-certification for the lower assurance level or an external certification for the highest assurance level. And we can go in the next slide, uh, please. Um, uh, the key things that we have for the for the NIST uh, 2.0 directive in the EU is that on uh, all the member states should adopt a national cybersecurity strategy designated uh, some of, of the company national authorities single uh, points of contact the member state should lay down cybersecurity risk management. Uh, especially the processes and also reporting obligation for the essential entities. So it's even very important that companies, they set up uh, internally uh, a reporting structure in which obligation are very well identified and raised up to the management level. And of course, uh, uh, there are initiatives like EU Cyclone and ENISA. And I want to spend some time about the what is on the ENISA, and we can go in the next slide, please. So ENISA uh, is really uh, uh, it was uh, end of last year they published a nice report on the connected and automated mobility. Uh, it's a nice report. I really suggest you to read it. And one of the key things, and we all understood and we debated in the webinar, is not just a piece of the puzzle that is relevant, but is all the things. So there is really an ecosystem of player, OEM, the tire one, the smart infrastructure, the telemon company, the third, uh, let's say, the, the, the who is delivering services, even, for example, the automotive uh, uh, operator aftermarket. And then on the left side, all the European institution, in this case, standardization bodies. So it's very important. And I like what has been shown by Jürgen and Thomas. We really need to have even tools that allow this ecosystem to interact on such a topics. But it's a quite a challenge. Some of those player, they may be quite advanced in applying the, uh, uh, the regulation and standardization other they could be completely new i'm thinking to for example operator after market so that the uh, there is in the report a very nice uh, set of diagram showing that each of the player they have a very different level of adoption and so that is one of the challenges we can go in the next slide please and uh, without going in detail, because I also want to give you an overview of what the other said. So the ENISA highlighted uh, the measures that we need to put in place at a different level, from the point of governance, from the point of view of, re of risk and ecosystem management, from the point of view of detection and reaction, from the point of view of maintenance in security condition, and then of course, IC, IT, OT. So that is what uh, uh, we, we are doing in Europe. And what I will uh, show in a second what's happening in China uh, is similar. But on the other hand, it also shows that the details uh, on each of those column and row may be different. So this is why, again, this initiative to align everybody is very, is very, is very important. We can go to the next slide, please. And in the next slide, uh, we, we start to see what is happening in China. Uh, so uh, this was provided by Yanan Zhang. It was very useful. Uh, she provided very, a very interesting insight on what's happening. One of, of the things she highlighted was the establishment of this CAVD, so the China Automobile Vulnerability uh, Database. As you can imagine, the purpose is the information and change of uh, uh, among the automotive and internet industry, including the terminal user uh, to understand what accident have been happening, the vulnerabilities uh, to uh, really construct an incident response center of the whole automotive industry and also have a systematic database, including also a statistic analysis to uh, uh, establish uh, if a certain threat is critical or not. And also on top of this CAVD, 
they also created uh, 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 um, an auto Isaac version in China, as you can include, uh, as you can see here, it includes members from China, Japan, Korea, and so forth. Then we can go in the next slide, please. And uh, and and then another thing that uh, uh, she provided as an overview is the list of cybersecurity related regulation and standard. As you can see, there are many. Uh, there are uh, some of them are recommended uh, uh, to assist companies to create a cybersecurity product. They may reference to mandatory. Uh, uh, to, to, type approval in the future. One of the issues that, of course, those are standard that are available just in Chinese, the standard one to five are open on the internet, and the other will be released uh, uh, in the second half of this year. So it will be very important to uh, see what's going on in some cases, like for example, the standard 11, it's the adoption, adoption, sorry, of the ISO uh, 21434 in China. So it will be, and since it's a quite a huge market, it's very important to see how this will be adopted or transformed. We can go to the next slide, please. And uh, uh, also, uh, Yanan, uh, she gave uh, the sixth uh, uh, somehow direction of, uh, of China in terms of cybersecurity industry. So first, of course, accelerate the establishment and implementation of the cybersecurity standard to improve uh, the approval uh, management of cybersecurity end to end from component to product vehicle Three, improve the testing system, a risk assessment system, especially for the intelligent connected vehicle. Four, establish the national areas uh, uh, for in which to test uh, uh, those kind of, uh, of interconnected uh, system with the uh, smart uh, uh, traffic system. And of course, so given the how the um, is organized in China, I think that's very interesting. It's one of the poor of the part in the world in which this kind of experiment are really important and big. And then the five, improve the information sharing across the automotive, the automotive industry. And six, accelerate uh, the construction of testing and certification system. I think this is also very related to some of the talks we will see later. Now, uh, I want to go ahead and we can go in the next slide piece, showing what has been introduced uh, uh, by, by Tiber. Uh, we can go in the next slide, please. Yes, so the last uh, set of the uh, slide in the webinar, they were related to a very uh, key topic. Uh, uh, in this case is the application areas of the computing of the done in a quantum way in automotive, but I, I see this as a paradigm for all the new technologies. So we could create such kind of a slide, not just for this type of computing, but of course for artificial intelligence, for any other new technologies that is entering very fast in the automotive field. In the case of the quantum type of computing, that I think you know very well what it is. Uh, 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 somehow, it, it's, we believe it can solve some of the criticalities in terms of uh, uh, intensity of the computation. And so the focus was mainly on the, 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 the vehicle to, to infrastructure. And the focus was on mainly on situational awareness and on how we guarantee uh, uh, in that kind of a system the, um, that we avoid and detect any cybersecurity threat. We can go to the next slide, please. And uh, this was what was shown by, by Tiber uh, 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 saying that a quantum safe uh, uh, vehicle to infrastructure ecosystem is mainly composed by three pieces, uh, a network of uh, quantum safe vehicle, uh, uh, the infrastructure, uh, and the uh, both on the transportation level as also between the edge and the cloud. 
And he highlighted some of the instruments that have been introduced, like the quantum random number uh, generation, the QRNNG, uh, the use, of course, of state of art and uh, uh, encryption ready for the quantum type of computing, as also the mechanism to distribute such kind of a key uh, in order that we uh, uh, avoid uh, the dropping of the encryption key. So it, it was very interesting that it is already a lot of activities ongoing in this field as well. And we can go in the next slide, please. And he uh, also uh, highlighted the five steps to uh, do a risk assessment uh, for the, the quantum uh, technologies. Of course, analyze all assets and determining uh, the level of uh, uh, protection. Uh, uh, what is very important is map the progress of the technology uh, with what is happening in the target system and also update in that way the uh, understanding of the attacks. And again, I see that as a paradigm for every new technology adopted in the automotive world. And then number three, uh, you test and validate the methods uh, to achieve the quantum safe uh, approach and then identify the threat actors. And, and of course, you at the end, you develop a plan. So that is a really something that you need to put in place and, and have it uh, alive. Okay, we can go in the next slide uh, that I think it's uh, um, also showing uh, that NIST uh, is working on adopt, uh, adapting the standardization to the quantum uh, uh, world. Uh, it is expected to have an initial version of the standard about that kind of a technology uh, in 2022. Uh, and implementing such kind of a things uh, uh, on the point of view of uh, 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 that was shared in the webinar will be one of, my, uh, of the challenges for the automotive industry. Good, so I think I am at the end of my slide. We can go on the next one. Uh, that is a kind of a summary. Um, so what is the, the conclusion at the end? Uh, and while I'm, um, I'm saying those points, you can see on the right side, a nice uh, uh, diagram showing even from the point of view, let's say of the visual feeling, how many are the points of attacks uh, and threat uh, into a, a vehicle uh, a today. Uh, so that is very important from cloud to the product uh, all across the life cycle. So first, experts from different regions are working all together already today to shape the standardization and regularization framework. However, there is indeed a kind of a, a, a overlap. Uh, in some cases, there could be contradiction and this is why we believe the IEEE can play a very important role. IEEE is an entity working from the bottom, from the ground, from the engineers, and they can, and we can certainly play that role to harmonize from the bottom. Then another point we have seen is that cybersecurity for those kind of uh, uh, automated vehicle or, or in general for the automated type of mobility is really a broad end-to-end -end scope involving many technologies, stakeholders, and so it's very critical to create synergies and connection. Third, as I mentioned, new technologies, AI, the, the, the quantum uh, uh, um, architecture and computing, but also the new way with which the automotive industry is creating businesses the over TA updates, the crowdsourced the services, the cloud-based services are really creating new opportunities for business, but also new challenges for the uh, overall cybersecurity. Uh, and so it's very important that we address the challenges now. Uh, and the connection, in my point of view, in between academic, industry expert, uh, uh, regulation and standardization is very important to keep and expand the, uh, the uh, technology and the solutions. 
Okay, so that is the end of my talk. Is there any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, I think there is a question which was forwarded by Max Turner. Max, are you there? Can you elaborate on your question a little bit more? Absolutely, I'm available here. Okay, so speak out, please. <laughs> so um, I think it was a while back in the talk that we talked about vehicle-to-vehicle um, -vehicle communication, and I've been I've been doing vehicle communication way back in the let's say early two thousands, and the discussion around security with vehicle-to-vehicle: -vehicle, how many vehicles do I need to trust? How can I trust vehicles that have not been online for a very long time? And if I'm downtown LA, how am I checking 200, 500, whatever certificates of vehicles that may be around me with a reasonable effort in, in hardware and software? Um, and I was just wondering whether the group, and it's a, it's a very open and general question, it's not, not, a, not a yes or no thing, I guess. Um, do we feel that with provisions like they're made in, um, in 6009.2, is, is that sufficient or do we, is, is there still quite, quite a mountain of work to do in order to actually do security in vehicle to vehicle communication? Ricardo, I think you are the best to answer that to the, as far as it's possible to be answered. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, in fact, so uh, again, I'm not a super expert in that standard. My experience in that one is that uh, I think it's sufficient for some of the pieces of the technologies you typically combine with other level standardization activities, including the process oriented one or the 21434. Indeed, the evolution of the vehicle to vehicle or the vehicle to infrastructure technologies is such that there are gaps indeed. Uh, now, uh, I think the working group, the, uh, that IEEE working group is working on it uh, to maybe extend or to create that. So my answer is that is sufficient for some of the technology combined with more high level uh, uh, standardization, but some gaps exist. That is my assessment. Yeah, I don't know if you agree with me, but that is my view. I'm, I'm happy with the answer for today. I think we'll have to do some more talking in the future. Okay, exactly. sure. Yeah, okay. okay, then there's another question from Xavi Villarubla. Xavi, are you there? Looks like. Yes, I'm here. Okay, so forward your question yourself, please, Xavi. Yeah, the point is uh, we know that the. IT industry has been uh, using the, the common criteria standard or, or ISO 15408 for a long time in a very successful way for secure elements, smart cards, IT devices, and many others, also some software. And my question is, how much uh, do you think, Ricardo, that this standard is applicable to the automotive industry for products like uh, ECUs, TCUs, GPUs, or... Um, there is a, 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 an important need of, of high level security assessment for some of those products and uh, the, the CC evaluations provide mm. this type of assessment. However, I'm not sure how applicable is that to the automotive industry specifics. Thank you. Uh, it's a good question. Um... I should ask that to a team we have in our company that is doing that kind of a, a, a map uh, in these days. I would say we identified that 21434 as the main uh, instrument uh, at the, our level, for example. But indeed, uh, some of the work products of this uh, ISO 15408 are also useful. So my approach in this case is to select some of the work product and combine with the streamline that in our case is 21434. That is my answer. Um, but I can certainly ask more details to my expert and, and send to you that additional information. 
for that link, okay? That would be great. Thank you very much. Okay, final question from my side, Ricardo. In, uh, you, in your description, what the EU is demanding, they just say uh, a good level of cyber security. Uh, what is a good level of cyber security? What does it mean really? Can we measure it? Yeah, so maybe this is a good link to what we have uh, uh, seen at the beginning. So uh, we definitely need, uh, in my point of view, a metric uh, to establish that good level. Uh, on the other end, uh, I think the, we are at the beginning and we don't want to stop technologies by having strong, uh, too strong requirement. So I think this is an evolution. Uh, I would say um, there is not a good or uh, so a, 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 a yet a kind of a uh, metric that has been uh, so fine grain agreed. I think it's important to have framework as the one shown at the beginning to evaluate the level of trustworthiness as a whole. Uh, but I will keep that kind of a definition because the state of art is evolving. This is my view. So regulation up to certain level, but so maybe other in this in this call they may disagree with me. Okay. Last but not least, did did anyone in the group try to get access to this Chinese Experience Data Bank or whatever it's called, the CAVD.org.cn? Did anyone try? Is it in Chinese or is it in English or? Nobody tried yet. Okay. I haven't yet. Okay, so then let's go to the next, please. Christina, the next, please. Thank you. So now we we had the overall umbrella. What is really trustworthiness? What is the concept? Uh, we did look for the global requirements world, which is not stable, of course, yet, but. It looks like at least they are working together to a good extent, but there may be local uh, yeah, requirements coming up. What is frightening the automotive industry for sure, uh, because they want global, implica uh, global applications, of course. So next speaker is going to be Tobias Gärtner. At the moment, he is a legal cybersecurity cyber specialist at BMW of North America. He studied at the TU in Germany in Braunschweig, uh, informatics, as well as at the University of Oklahoma. Tobias, your stage. Thank you. All right, so I want to talk about more um, about the collaboration side in cybersecurity. So how can the industry engage in collaborations uh, that protect the vehicles. That's basically the topic of my talk. Uh, okay, next slide. I um, put in that slide because it's my first time speaking here. And uh, yeah, so Axel, you uh, explained that perfectly. Next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so um, yeah, there are these uh, mega trends in automotive, the so-called ACES, autonomous, connected, electrified, and shared vehicles. And uh, they bring more and more complexity into our world as engineers. So, uh, and with more complexity, there is also a higher probability of um, security vulnerabilities in the product. And uh, this is the trend the industry has to, has to, um, yeah, be very careful about and uh, we, we've seen all the regulations that uh, Ricardo just uh, explained and um, so with that I want to talk about more um, about the vehicle ecosystem so next slide so if we look at the vehicle e ecosystem okay it's a little bit blurred there um, on the left side we have the car and then we have uh, customer interfaces for uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, for example, the automated vehicle has sensors, 
if, it's, if it has a combustion engine, it needs an OBD2 port for repair and maintenance. And of course, we have uh, charging if it's an electrical vehicle or a um, plug-in hybrid or something like that. And then the vehicle has a telematics connection to the back end and um, with a MNO in between, basically, a mobile network operator. And uh, then this backend uh, has many different tasks. For example, a realized functionality to remotely control your, your car with, your, with an app, yeah? or um, ADAS functional functionality, so automated driving uh, functionality, but also data sharing. And uh, for that, we have that neutral server concept. And um, we also have third parties then um, getting access to customer data in the vehicle if the customer gives consent. And of course, we have our supply chain and uh, manufacturing and the plant. So this uh, ecosystem looks very complicated. And uh, it is hard to defend that against the numerous threats. So next slide, please. So who are these uh, threat actors? I um, put some here on that slide. So we have data collectors, we have untrustworthy workshops that want to sell uh, functionality uh, or activate functionality in the vehicle that the customer didn't want to pay the full price for. Um, data thieves, then PR hackers. So hackers that um, um, show that an exploit in the vehicle is uh, critical and uh, they want to become famous or um, either uh, brush up their resume with that or uh, push their own uh, business. And uh, then we have uh, also industrial espionage or nation state actors, so-called APTs, advanced persistent threats. Uh, we've seen manufacturing lines of our competitors targeted by ransomware attacks uh, by the end of last year. And uh, so there are also some trends, which I want to talk about uh, in a second that we uh, that we see. OK, um, so to get more information about who these attackers are, um, we have to do certain analysis. And I want to show that on the next slide. So, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I want to talk about the challenges first before I dive into the uh, to, into the threat analysis part. So the challenge of our sector is that we have that complex supply chain. So we reuse ECUs and um, basically, or the suppliers sell platforms and customize those for OEMs. And if there's a vulnerability in one of those platforms, not just a BMW might be um, affected, but by it, but also one of our competitors. So we can say an, an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. And also um, we as a sector are um, in a difficult time because um, the adaption of automated features uh, depends on trustworthy of the customer in our product. And uh, we don't want to give away that trust easily with uh, some stupid vulnerabilities we could have found. <laughs> so, um, and our sector also has a, has a difference because uh, cybersecurity ownership is with the OEM, but the vehicle ownership is with the customer. And uh, that means that uh, we don't know if the customer installed security updates in terms of bringing in his vehicle to the dealership to get stuff fixed, or if it's not OTA capable, or if we can push out an OTA to the vehicle, vehicle if the customer installs it. And uh, so this is also one of the, one of the issues. Uh, we've seen that in, um, in safety recalls. So there, for example, there's the Takata uh, airbag recall going on for quite some years. And uh, my colleagues here in the US are chasing customers to get their airbags fixed, something that is critical, right? So, and uh, now we talk about some cybersecurity vulnerability that might not even be safety critical. So uh, this is also one of the challenges in the sector, that uh, mindset basically, plus uh, yeah, lack of technological adaption sector-wide so not everyone can do vehicle over the air updates yet and um yeah attackers collaborate too 
so uh, they exchange exploits for credentials and so on so why shouldn't defenders collaborate and i put that picture of the london marathon 2017 on the right side because uh, cyber security is really a marathon it's not a sprint and uh, one of the runners collapsed 500 meters before the finish line and his competitor helped him over the fin finish line so i think that is a a nice picture to uh, show that uh, even when somebody's struggling, we should still help each other out and uh, also learn from other people's mistakes because uh, that's better than doing the mistakes ourselves. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, threat intelligence. Next slide, please. So um, threat intelligence is a discipline from IT security and it's, it is actually about um, analyzing network logs and identifying uh, intrusion or data exfiltration and um, network forensics so to say so you have like this huge amount of raw data in your in your logs and then you have tools that help you to abstract data and turn that into information and then you can apply knowledge uh, about a certain attack and the whole process on how to get that knowledge about an attacker is called intelligence and um, this is something which is also important for the automotive industry so um, the new regulations and standards they uh, um, require oems to build up a cybersecurity um, vehicle operations center and uh, so we have to monitor our fleet for example so that is basically reading a lot or processing a lot of data but on the other hand you need uh, that embedded knowledge and also um, offensive capabilities of that person that is analyzing attacks so this is a new discipline and um, it is very important to ask questions what an attacker did who the attacker is what is the motivation have we seen an attack in other products and then with that knowledge, we can design uh, our um, security safeguards in the products and can also um, yeah, target these better and detect trends. And uh, I mentioned one of the ransomware trends earlier. So um, this will definitely spray into our sector sooner or later and uh, maybe even into the vehicle ransomware. So we have to be very careful about that and uh, design the necessary safeguards now um, ISO 21434 um, gives the industry a tool for threat and risk ass assessment. So th those are important things to think about um, attacks upfront, but also um, look what, what is out there in the wild and uh, yeah, use that knowledge. So um, another lesson I learned besides that hybrid skill set is that uh, as a company, you have to be open to ethical researchers. So these are the good guys. And uh, I showed the, the bad guys on the slide earlier. And uh, so a vulnerability disclosure program or bug bounty program helps uh, to encourage ethical researchers to contact you and share their uh, findings with you. Uh, I actually put links to BMW's programs here. Uh, that's why this is highlighted. And um, yeah, of course, it's it's important to stay up to date by reading threat reports, uh, common vulnerability enumerations, so-called CVEs, uh, which is a system to catalog vulnerabilities and also characterize those in uh, open source software, for example, or also proprietary software. But then you have to analyze if uh, you have that in your product. And um, yeah, cert newsletters are important and um yeah with all that you can get a really good picture of the ttps the uh, tactics um techniques and procedures of an attacker okay next slide so um please give it a couple of clicks i think it's eight yeah so we have uh, many many sources to ingest as um, threat intelligence analysts. So we have everything which is available open source, so on the internet. Then we have the disclosure and bug bounty program. There are third party threat intelligence providers that you can hire and uh, leverage and uh, also attend security conferences, uh, 
read through the papers and uh, figure out new trends. But uh, one of the biggest sources for us is the auto ISAC. And I will will talk about what the auto ISAC is in a in a second. So all that knowledge is basically processed, pre-filtered, and uh, then the actual valuable intelligence is forwarded to our security engineers that can then improve the vehicle security uh, long term or to the incident response team for further investigations and remediation. And um, that feedback loop is uh, also required in the many um, standards and regulations that uh, Ricardo just um, presented on. Okay, next slide, please. So this is uh, about the auto Isaac. Um, give it another, some clicks, please. So where does it come from? It's, uh, it has been founded in the US in uh, 1998, basically the concept of an ISAC information sharing and analysis center. And it was um, introduced to secure critical infrastructure sector, which is privately owned and it's a high percentage in the US. And um, so the government wanted a private public partnership to um, increase resiliency. And uh, the ISAC itself is a non-profit organization and it's industry funded and it's basically an information broker for the sector. And uh, today there are 24 ISACs and uh, for multiple sectors, for example, energy, financial, aviation, automotive. And um, quite interesting, uh, I spoke about um, vehicle ownership earlier so we have some regulation uh, like the management system and so on but if you look at other sectors there are very strict regulations on information sharing so there's a big difference if you own a nuclear power plant or a, a vehicle in terms of information sharing requirements with the government and information in the auto isaac is is shared uh, with the government only on a voluntary basis so um I assume that the Chinese auto ISAC that they founded is a, is a more uh, yeah, closer collaboration with the government. So with that database, they probably have insight into everything that's going on. But um, the auto ISAC is in control of that information flow and uh, you need consensus in order to publish information. So it is a safe haven to talk about vulnerabilities, incidents, threats, um, best practices, it has an online collaboration platform and hosts many workshops and so on. And the staff of the Auto ISAC facilitates that uh, information sharing and also um, checks that everything is compliant with antitrust laws or uh, EU anti uh, cartel laws. And uh, there's even a legal working group that advises uh, the ISAC and they refute their bylaws and so on. Um, yeah, consisting of lawyers uh, from different OEMs and tier one and tier two suppliers. So the membership in the auto ISAC is, um, I just mentioned that it is limited to suppliers, OEMs, and um, you have to have business in the US and it's uh, only tier one and tier two suppliers. So uh, there are 50, I think 58 members now, we just uh, added two more members uh, in the meantime. And um, it's, there's also a global expansion ongoing for the Southeast Asian sector, but also for the European um, or region. And um, the European region is a little bit, uh, has a little bit more progress. So we uh, have planned to open an office in Europe uh, this year. It's probably gonna be a virtual one with all the COVID uh, that's going on, but uh, that's, that's the plan for now. So, um, I put in a little remark here, uh, why the auto industry founded the ISAC. So, uh, well, there was a couple of incidents between 2012 and 14 published and NHTSA pushed the industry to do something against the cyber threat. And uh, so in 2015, the industry formed the ISAC and uh, quite interestingly, one month later, the cheap hack occurred and gave the, the ISAC foundation uh, a little more uh, spin. And uh, the ISAC is very important for BMW. BMW is also one of the founding members. So in the last uh, 
guideline and also in the previous guideline that NHTSA published on cybersecurity. Uh, the ISAC is explicitly mentioned and membership and information sharing in the ISAC is encouraged. Okay, so next slide. So what is so important about the auto ISAC for BMW? Um, give it a couple of clicks, please. Five, I think. So it is the best source for automotive threat intelligence. So um, the analysts of the ISAC, they uh, curate the information, they uh, read a lot on the internet, and uh, then they, they um, write reports and share those with the membership and also facilitate discussions around certain um, ind industry incidents, um, which is very helpful. So this is uh, way better than threat intelligence that you can purchase because uh, you get the perspective of the industry, not just of your threat intelligence provider. Um, the Auto ISAC also released seven best practice guides. Uh, I was also involved in uh, creating those. And um, these best practice guides are about topics like incident response, um, governance, um, awareness, uh, third party engagements, um, security development lifecycle. And uh, they came out um, during the time when uh, the ISO standard was not finished, but they are also aligned with the ISO standard for the most part. They will be revisited after the ISO comes out uh, by the middle of this year as a, an official standard. Um, yeah, the ISAC also offers interesting projects and events. And um, so there, for example, there is a um, annual summit, which is uh, held at member locations. Um, it's a great opportunity for networking and also to see what's going on in the industry, not just for uh, the industry itself, but also for other sectors or uh, the public sector. Um, interesting projects because the ISAC helps um, to reach compliance with UNECE by um, by uh, yeah, working on certain projects. For example, there's a project about the software bill of material, um, which gives um, suppliers and also OEMs more insight on how to set up this uh, big, um, yeah, this big project, um, having a software bill of material, which is managed at an OEM, at a tier one and a tier two, and then this information is exchanged and then you can do run checks if there are CVEs, for example, in the in the software version used in your product. So we are really um, getting more transparency and trying to reduce the black boxes that we uh, used to purchase in the past uh, as OEMs. And uh, yeah, I already mentioned the community is fast growing. So the ISAC um, added, I think, probably 20 new members since I joined it in 2018. And um, yeah, the community expands more and more to Europe now, which is a good thing because we have many talented people in Europe and we have to engage those in discussions. And uh, as of now, there is no comparable uh, entity in Europe. So uh, we need something time zone friendly there and uh, also reduce, okay, now with COVID <laughs> business travel is uh, canceled for the most part, but uh, that was one of the big roadblocks to fly people into the US because it just takes, takes a lot of time. And uh, so by the end of last year, we also launched a members teach members workshop series. So basically members um, can volunteer and present on a topic which is uh, troubling the industry. Um, all right, and with that, I am at the end of my presentation. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Uh, and sorry that uh, PowerPoint or Zoom did scramble your letter somehow a little bit, at least the font. <laughs> the BMW specific font seems not to be really compatible with wherever the mistake happened, doesn't matter. Yes. Uh, there's a question from Laurie Thusenhaus. Looks like you like this vulnerability disclosure. Laurie, are you there?
Yeah, I think it's just a, uh, a, a applauding yeah. comment. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yes, I, I am here. Um, I, I, am, uh, I work for CERT CC and I'm very interested in uh, making comments. I'm concerned about end of life at this point. Um, the, I understand the difference between guidance and requirements and I can appreciate the um, difference between uh, government participation and support. So what I'm, what I'm wondering is how much thought has been given to end of life and, and supporting, supporting the uh, 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 responsibility that manufacturers have to support those vehicles. Yeah, what so <laughs> um, this is a, a very big topic uh, that is being discussed in the ISO SAE 21434 um, industry working groups. So in the past, it was uh, before that standard uh, came up, that was um, really up to the OEM how long they wanted to uh, support it. And now it is um, at least the framework is giving in the standard on how long you should support it. Yeah. Plus uh, the UN ECE regulation, which also uh, foresees uh, or includes some, uh, yeah, or not some, but support. So um, thing is with uh, end of life, you always have to do risk-based uh, decisions, right? So, um, if it's a vulnerability in a service, maybe you can um, define the end of that service at some point of the vehicle life. Yeah, so uh, that also means we would have to include those into our into to our um, yes contracts and business models with the customers because uh, then they don't buy something they will own their whole lives. They buy something with support, and that support could end at some point in time. And um, if we look. At the vehicle, most of the um, or the most troubling vulnerabilities are those uh, that would enable a fleet attack with a safety impact. So that for a fleet attack or for these scalable attacks, you need the telematics connection. And uh, so we, we have to have measures in place to deactivate that connection in case something uh, happens. So this is, uh, is also very important for the industry. Did it answer your question? <laughs> yeah, it, it uh, certainly. Hmm? I'm glad you're concerned about it. I heard you mention it, and I thought I would take the opportunity. Um, I have a truck in my garage right now that is more than 20 years old, and I can't imagine being a manufacturer that <laughs> that is going to continue to be responsible for uh, issuing patches and fixes and and for 20 years on, on down the line yeah. and keeping track of all the other moving pieces, uh, the, the uh, pieces and parts that are going in, and who's writing the firmware interfaces and things like that. So yes, yeah, so uh, it's a nightmare waiting to happen. It's a nightmare. <laughs> it, it is definitely a challenge. I agree with that. And uh, that also means that, uh, yeah, basically the, industry has to transform uh, in a sense that we have to keep the the tool chains and build environments uh, we have to basically conserve that or preserve that in case something happens down the line and then we can at least uh, work again on an update even if it's 10 years after end of life for example so this is also something uh, that we think about and uh, how to improve uh, the situation. OK, yeah, so there to, were some other questions. Right. Just to uh, elaborate a little bit on that, we, as, uh, as you know, I was responsible on the after sales side the last 10 years of my BMW professional life. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I do own two uh, BMW old timer cars, which are 30 and 45 years old. So could you imagine that there is one day a situation that I can't drive with my old car anymore? So that the two roadworthy uh, authorities in the world may take a car out of, out of service because of 
<clears throat> cybersecurity vulnerability or so on? Is that something you are thinking about? Or <clears throat> what is your vision on it? I think uh, if, if a regulation like this uh, comes out, um, then we we messed up as a sector. So now is the time to okay. improve that situation by implementing security by design. <laughs> so uh, we ha now we have to basically uh, yeah, not just be compliant with UNEC. I, I think UNEC, yes, it's a challenge because it's a short amount of time to implement it, but I think it's the right thing for our sector to get more security into the product. So, and uh, this is one motivation, but uh, it's not just about being compliant. It's also about making the product more safe and uh, more secure. Um, I saw okay. two other questions. I don't want to uh, yeah. so steal, steal too much study, time. There is another question from your side, third party independent labs. Xavi, may you speak out yourself, please? Yes, I'm working myself in a cybersecurity lab, third party independent cybersecurity lab called Brightside in the Netherlands. And we used to work quite a lot for other industries or the verticals like payment, uh, uh, um, government, um, many other sectors, right? Telco products. And the question goes to uh, how much the automotive industry and the OEMs in this case, or also tier ones could be, how much do they rely or used to work with third party independent cybersecurity labs, which has been demonstrated a good tool for, for other sectors to improve cybersecurity and provide uh, good levels of assessment. Yeah, if we work together with uh, independent contractors. Um... So we have a, let's call it a hybrid approach. So we have internal an, an internal pen testing department. Uh, I was uh, working in that for two and a half years. So we um, basically built up this lab for um, with internal capabilities. So we could conduct our own pen tests, but also needed um, contractors to uh, facilitate tests. And this, this is due to the nature of cybersecurity because it's a very broad field where you can drill down very deeply into certain areas. So you really need the help of specialists. So yes, it's, it's a tool that the industry needs to leverage in order to, and, to overcome the challenges. And ju just, just one second. Uh, to my understanding, Unicy is also trying to put like a, uh, uh, third party uh, um, labs uh, type approval in, in place, right? Uh, I think so, yeah. Um, actually, NHTSA has Volpe Lab here in the US who also conduct cybersecurity uh, or pen tests on vehicles. So there are some, uh, some developments on the uh, yeah, regulator side. So, and for okay. UNEC, I think they, uh, yeah. they also hire to Fendegra and like these uh, certification agencies who also build up uh, security knowledge and pen testing knowledge right now. Okay, then there's another question from Anu Goyanur concerning aftermarket again. Anu, are you there? Yep, I'm here, thank you. Um, sorry, my question um, is I'm calling from the UK. I just um, had a question about tertiary aftermarket parts. Like for example, nowadays you can get uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi module uh, dongles to connect, um, you, you know, that's not certified. For example, it, uh, how do you go about protecting the physical layers in the vehicle uh, or like from flooding from hackers, for example? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah um, so <laughs> If you um, look at these aftermarket parts, you probably uh, refer to um, the OBD dongles for tuning and that kind of stuff that have a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi interface and come with an app. Sometimes the app is not very secure or the Wi-Fi password is not secure or um, yeah, the customer leaves the dongle in the vehicle while, while uh, they're driving around. So uh, that can create a new attack surface. And this attack surface has to be part of the um, TARA, the threat analysis and risk assessment. So basically you have to think about which can messages are safety critical and uh, do they need additional um, safeguards? So from a system level, you can uh, maybe use some technological uh, yeah, measures like uh, 
um, how is it called, uh, like um, method, message authentication, um, or uh, maybe have new integrity checks implemented to detect those uh, attacks. So this is something because it, the vehicle is owned by the customer. So we have to come up with uh, good concepts to secure the critical communication in the vehicle, but also giving the customer the flexibility to do with their vehicles what they want. So it, it is definitely a spread, but uh, if you uh, think about those attack scenarios early on, you can uh, defend against those. Yeah, I mean, you can you can defend against spoofing, but you can't defend against flooding in a V2V or V2I or V2X infrastructure. So let's say somebody is uh, sell somebody a, a, a fake uh, a dongle just to hack or just to flood messages so that other uh, communication doesn't enter, uh, you know, the, the particular architecture. Yeah, but you can maybe detect the flooding. So on the ECU itself, you know, by adding additional safeguards. So if there are 10 messages coming in that are not changing, for example, or there's a, a detection model, then, so it's a, it's a game of cat and mouse, basically. That's what security is. So you come up with a defense for an attack and then the attacker comes up with another attack and you have to you have to reiterate. So um, yeah, it's, it's probably going to, uh, going to become uh, too technical and too uh, time intensive. Yeah. I don't want to. Sorry. So if you want to follow up with me, uh, you can uh, send me an email. Uh, please reach out to uh, Axel. He can forward you my contact. Great. Thank you. Thank yes. you okay. very much. All so right. a last Thank you. Uh, overall question, maybe, oh. to me is, uh, you mentioned that there are different ISACs for medical, for aviation, and so on. Is there also a platform provided to learn from other industries? Yes. So there is a national council of ISACs here in the US, and they basically, um, uh, yeah, they, they facilitate this um, sector exchange between ISACs. OK, perfect. So, so ISACs can share threat reports with each other. OK. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you, Tobias. That was really enlightening. And I like the approaches of openness and fairness uh, to talk with one another and to learn from each other. So this is now the time for a coffee break. We are a little late, so I would like to change the timing a little bit. Uh, I think we should continue at five minutes to three European time. So five minutes shorter coffee break and 10 minutes late to the agenda. Uh, so five minutes to three o'clock European time. We will be back for you. Okay, so next is going to be Philipp Schneidenbach. He is at the moment responsible at Ventum Consulting in Munich as a principal for IT governments. Yes. Before he worked as a CTO at the 3W Group Enterprise, uh, doing enterprise integration management. I always like integration because all my life I did integration. It's the utmost to learn, to put things together. And initially, he worked at SFC in energy concern, and he was responsible for energy management systems. Philip, your stage. Thank you very much. I hope that everybody can hear and see me fine. And I would yes. like to um, okay. move on to the first slide of my deck. Next, please. So the first of three parts of my talk will be adversarial examples, which is kind of a challenge to stateful technology in a stateless environment, special for um, level four autonomous vehicles. So next, please. I would like to start with um, those day-to-day -day objects that we see every time. One is very easy bananas most obviously and the other one could be like a microwave or a toaster so if you give it another click please most obviously this is the toaster and another click now we have the full scope so for us as human beings it's pretty easy 
to have image recognition based on the model that we've been trained with stuff and data that we have seen before. And if we click on next, we see how easy it will be to trick a machine learning system. Um, I've always copied the archive link for you to dive into the research on top of the page for the next slides. And you can see um, simply a picture with a certain digital signature on a desk can help identify a banana as a toaster. So if we bring that to traffic, then of course we are not fearing bananas or toasters on the road, but we are fearing human beings. So please, the next slide with the nice gentleman there from Belgium um, that found out that with a certain adversarial patch, you can even hide human beings from image recognition systems. So if we transfer that to a road, a traffic scenario, which we can see on the next slide, please, then it would be um, not such a good thing if an adversarial patch as grainy and very specific as we can see on the bottom left. It's only like it would be a dirty camera can even change the prediction of a street scene to a road free to drive. So the guys at Robert Bosch GmbH in the University of Freiburg in Germany found out that there are certain vulnerabilities to image recognition systems that are especially harmful if they would be applied in traffic. Now, every time when I'm presenting stuff like that, people ask me, how come that machines are so, let's say, unintelligent? And I always say, well, optical recognition is always a pretty complex thing. Let's move on the next slide and show you something that is complex for you as a human being. Um, I, I'm not so sure if those lines are tilted or not. So what we need is a certain verification pattern. Next slide, please. And with the verification pattern, we instantly see that it's just fooling our senses. I have another one for you. If we go to the next slide and we see, well, nah, they, it can't be like, really horizontal, can it? And if we go to the next slide, we see with a certain verification pattern, we see, well, it's just playing with our senses. So the punchline is, and when we go to the next slide, we need standards for those situations. And the punchline is that machine learning and image recognition systems they cannot yet deliver the same amount of security, accuracy and, and security that is expected from us as drivers or as well as insurers want or risk managers or legal authorities. So um, some feasible countermeasures for better standards and where some people, of course, already are, are already working on is um, pre-departure LIDAR or time of flight calibration and time of flight cameras are a hot thing because they are even in smartphones to, to measure the depth of field for a better image or reference vehicle pairing, micro platooning, vehicle to vehicle communication, lane view and angle comparison like we know from our eyes. For us as human beings, it only takes 10 cent centimeters of diversification, whether a scene is three dimensional or only has two dimensions or whether something is really in our reach or not. And of course, traffic lights and imaging plausibility, like um, where 5G will help. If I'm at, at a red light, I don't need the car to, to like look for people, whether it's allowed to drive. I simply need to, to read uh, the data coming from the traffic light. And um, one item that I will um, deep dive into in the third part of my talk is the MITRE uh, adversarial threat metrics that can help to prevent data stream proxying and data model poisoning with tainted data. And I will go into it um, because it is um, the punchline of my entire talk in the third part of my talk. If you want to um, dive into those interesting um, fields of, of expertise and, and research, I can highly recommend the Black Hat EU talk on LiDAR spoofing, as well as the IEEE talk from, um, I would say roughly 14 months ago, um, regarding the statement of Elon Musk, whether LiDARs are a crutch or not. I, I copied the links there and I uh, hope that, that you like them. It helped me a lot to, to, um, 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 to, to check the, the sources that I copied uh, regarding the current research. So let's move on to the next slide, which brings us to the second part of my talk. Um, 5G frequency clogging is the name that I found for it. And um, it 
it actually happened when preparing this talk. So if we move on to the next slide, um, I I'm working from home as, as most of, of you guys will right now. And what I really love is the fact, as you can see with the green lines, um, that you can have a laptop and with USB 3.0 and USB-C connections, you can have one cable for everything like charging your laptop, having your USB devices, having your mouse, card reader, even a display by simply plugging in one cable when you come to your desk. I love that. So when I got a secondary monitor to have more space to work on, I of course used an HDMI cable to connect it. And um, then I worked and two hours later, strange things happened. Like my Wi-Fi dropped off and, and okay, then I, I restarted my router and um, then my, my display went blank. <laughs> I said to myself, what's happening here? And uh, I wanted to understand it. And I dig into the standards and I found out, well, and the cable, the HDMI cable that I'm using, I guess it's a little bit old, maybe six to eight years or something. I had it in my cupboard. And um, when, I, when, when I looked at it, then I saw, okay, well, it's an HDMI cable from a time back when there was an HDMI 1.4 standard, which is like compatible with 3.4 gigahertz of signaling and it is shielded until this frequency. Uh, the current standard that my laptop and my new monitor would use would be HDMI 2.0, which requires cables to be shielded up to 6.0 gigahertz. So I thought to myself, wow, does this really mean that there is some kind of clocking going on in the HDMI standard that would interfere with my Wi-Fi? And I found out, yes, it does, because Wi-Fi with 802.11 AC 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi is using a mechanism known as DFS, dynamic frequency selection, and um, it can be interfered and then it's looping and then your Wi-Fi connection is dropping off. And the punchline is I, I simply bought a new uh, HDMI cable and um, I'm using it right now and everything is working perfectly. And I thought to myself, wow, um, when we are talking about standards and automotive, it wouldn't be so cool if somebody would bring his cable into the car and we wouldn't know the standard of it because HDMI doesn't diversify from the standards when it comes to the plugs. It's simply the same plug since 10 years. So if you move on to the next slide, we all know that people are bringing everything to their cars, okay? A standard consumer is using his charging cable as long as it works. He doesn't care if it's like optically broken or used or torn or worn. Um, if the shielding is maybe not so good anymore, he simply uses it as long as it works. And the next thing is, it's not only a charging cable. A USB cable would only need two lines for charging. But um, this is a data cable because it has four lines. So two data lines and two lines for power. So this means if somebody plugs in a device with this cable, he basically can provide all kinds of device classes like a multifunctional device, networking wireless, mass storage, you name it, input devices, keyboards. Well, so I thought to myself, wow, this, this is some, some kind of um, um, plug and play scenario going on there. And if then the, um, the standard is misused, this could, can be a bad thing. And I heard about that already and I dig deeper into it. So if we go to the next slide, um, I knew about people bringing stuff to their Tesla and trying to find out what this Tesla ecosystem is connecting via plug and play. They are bringing floppy drives, um, mice, um, pen drives, keyboards, game controllers, everything, and post it on Twitter and say, hey, it's cool. I don't believe that it's so cool because I know that with USB cables and integrated payloads into USB cables, you can do a lot of bad stuff. Like you can interfere systems, implement keyloggers, or um, simply take over systems entirely, or simply apply some kind of malware to the system. And the, the thing is, it has already evolved from like USB as something that you need to physically physically plug in into wireless. And two female hackers, um, one is Kate Temkin and one is Jiska, found out that with USB, you can do a lot of nasty stuff. Like um, they found out that the Nintendo Switch, which is a very ubiquitous popular gaming console, does have a bootloader, well, 
some kind of exploit that you can use to take over the system. Now, how would you manage to give somebody a USB cable and then let him this reboot the system for you? Of course, you might need to reboot the system yourself. And just found out, found out that um, with a certain attack named Spectre, you can reach approximately 80 to 90% of systems in the market because they are ut utilizing Broadcom integrated Bluetooth and Wi-Fi chipsets. And by sending out a certain malicious packet, those systems receive a kernel panic and they simply reboot. So if you are in a crowded room and you would send out this packet, most likely from 10 people, eight cell phones would reboot. So this means you can hack and implement and plug and play and reboot systems, whether you touch them or not. So what does this mean when it comes to attack surface and, and, and what, what happens if you really put it to a car? Next slide, please. Um, and, and the proof is um, a, li a little bit old, but uh, it's still very, very, very current because the Tesla hack named Freefall from the guys from Keen Labs and Tencent Security uh, was like the first wireless proof that you can inject Khan messages into the Khan bus wirelessly. And 10 days later in 2016, Tesla responded and implemented um, security to their OTA mechanism by um, introducing code signing for their cars. So what we see is that the scenario is quite real. And if we go to the next slide, we, what we need to do is to understand that a lot of convenience-based plug and play from the 90s is simply made for your home, your gaming console, or your PC, but not for a car. So interfaces generally do not authenticate in a scenario like USB, HDMI, and wireless. They simply communicate without you letting them communicate or, or being asked if you want to. So USB ports are everywhere and every battery powered device, even your toothbrush maybe does have a USB connector to charge it. And in the field, consumers are plugging in their phones into everything just to put juice in their phone. And wireless, it's so ubiquitous, even the lawnmower of my neighbor next door is utilizing wireless, even before the 5G shift is even happening. So you cannot so easily get a hold of legacy tech or update it or secure it retrospectively. And in a future scenario, we need to do it differently. So um, if you click one time, please. Um, technology evergreening refers to um, updating technology from time to time to um, keep it secure. Like, you know, maybe from your Office 365 software on your PC that is get, getting updates constantly. And we need to have that for peripherals as well so that the threat metrics and the threat pattern for a car would then lower. Like we need to authenticate all peripherals. This means USB cables in cars need to authenticate before they communicate with the ecosystem. And we need a health radar approach for cars because right now, let's be honest, a car can tell you my oil level is low or my battery is dead, but it cannot tell you whether there is really only something to charge at a port or whether somebody is bringing his game controller to a Tesla. So with current tech, like with signatures and distributed ledger, everything that we have developed past the last five to 10 years, we could definitely help transferring peripherals between cars securely and mission critical applications that move to wireless such as 5G really need kind of a quality of service authentication like security to be resilient. So connected devices, they need management, software defined security will be something together with an evergreening approach that needs to become a standard. And how would we do that if we move on to the next slide? Um, working with our customers like we do with BMW, Zeiss, KUKA, or other industry players like Bosch or Daimler. Well, um, what we see is they are aware that their IT architectures um, are the starting point of everything. So next slide, please. And what, what is really interesting that around 2016, we've heard CVEs and, and, and NIST already from the other speakers. Um, IT managers and then responsibles and risk managers found out it's, it's really a good thing that since then, like four to five years ago, people started to audit their infrastructures regarding vulnerabilities that could be there, even though nothing is happening. Up to 2016, security was kind of reactive, like nothing is happening, everything will be okay. But since then, people are checking with CVEs, with those common vulnerability enumerations for issues in their systems and infrastructures before they are put into production and while they are in production. So if we transfer that into an autonomous driving scenario, then we come to the next slide, which is very 
I would say, brand new, um, also from MITRE, like uh, the CDE system, the adversarial ML threat metrics. So where does it come from? Well, in the last three years, like all those major companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, you name it, um, have had their ML systems tricked or evaded or misled or something. And the, 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 will con the trend will continue. And according to a Gartner report, like 30% of cyber attacks in the next years will involve data poisoning, model theft, or adversarial examples, as we've seen with the banana at the toaster. So we see that industry is underprepared. And um, in a, at a survey, like with 28 organizations, 25 said they did not know how to secure their machine learning systems. And it's a really nice report. I put the um, archive link there for the PDF. Very, very interesting. So this matrix is um, developed by 12 industry and academic research groups. And um, they wanted to empower analysts to orient themselves regarding standard patterns that are used by hackers and other bad guys to, to, to audit their systems while they are still in development. So the framework is a seeded curated set with vulnerabilities and adversarial behaviors that are, if you know them and if you, if you implement something against them, you definitely have kind of an effective um, um, protection um, for your production ML systems. And it's very new. I, 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 I guess October last year, um, the link is on the bottom. It's on GitHub and it's open and it's um, really, very, really, very, very interesting. And my last slide, the next slide um, is um, my final punchline and um, my, my summary, what would be my recommendations, um, what we would need for autonomous driving to be more secure and um, where are we and what is the bridge to tomorrow? Generally, when we are approaching a car, we already like need to authenticate. We have, we have a key or we have a key fob or a transmitter, or maybe if you have a very new car, you can authenticate with your phone. So like you are allowed to use it. And then there is condition-based access. Like, are you sitting on your chair in your car? Is there body weight? Otherwise the car would sense, okay, some, there is nobody. I mean, we have those weight sensors because of buckling up in a car. And um, like biometrics, we also have biometrics already. Like, does the driver still respond to steering? We, we, we have this condition-based use already. And we have some kind of ecosystem validation. I mean, um, a car checks a lot of systems that need to be in place before a certain, let's say, assistant function is enabled. So the first three things, I guess we already have them, but for um, autonomous driving, we would definitely need more. Let's need more. Let's, let's pretend the human being is not present in the car because we, we need um, we, we want to have um, autonomous driving at a high level. Then we need a constant risk evaluation. Like we need to validate are all peripherals in the car the same as when we have started? Are they still secure? Is somebody fiddling around with a USB port? Um, what about the route? What about the configuration? Is somebody touching any cables? Right now, cars would simply drive as long as you don't cut the fuel supply or don't interfere with the OBD port. Or scoring-based enabling of functions like how does somebody behave in the car? What is with environmental limitations like we see right now in the middle of Germany where it's very cold and there are severe weather conditions or whether there are certain anomalies in the IT systems. And this could lead to revoking functions of um, autonomous driving. Like right now, a car that you would buy would simply tell you like 30 seconds, please touch the steering wheel. Otherwise I will brake and stop at the side of the road. But of course we want more intelligence. So we need the scoring to be more sophisticated, as well as on route checking, like what is going on on the route? What do other cars see? What do other cars do? What are the traffic metrics beyond is there traffic or is there no traffic? Road censoring or route events, like somebody is stopping one kilometer ahead. What does this mean for an autonomous uh, mini platooning way of driving maybe? And of course, a post-drive configuration analysis to understand what has happened on the route. Is it safe for the next time or does, has the car learned that it's a little bit out of bounds and just may, maybe do a little bit more than simply display a message to refill your wiper fluid so that you have a clear windshield? This is something that we have already, but when it comes to really behavioral analysis of the car and all those under autonomous systems, we don't have it yet. So in this decade, as architecture definitely need to validate themselves again and again while they are used, as a growing number of activists, researchers, and criminals target their status quo, we need software-defined connect tech that is on the rise, and it simply cannot be secured without ongoing validation. I still believe 
that um, we have all technical possibilities to bring something into place and have it work. But to make it secure, we need to work on exactly what I've been presenting you. And um, I had um, a good time presenting this and a good time preparing. And I hope, I hope that there will be some questions that I would um, like to hear an answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. Most interesting to have such kind of a uh, very practical point of view. Uh, of course, I like and the automotive industry learned in the recent years to use uh, consumer technology just to, uh, to counteract cost increases. Uh, but what you are showing, of course, yeah. Mm. So this is a contradiction. On, on one hand, if you take uh, household technology, uh, to control a fridge into a car, which can be cyber attacked to cause an accident, this is a problem. How, how do you see that in general? Well, I, I believe that we need to understand that technology um, can always be a big harm. I, I, I haven't invented this sentence. I've learned that myself. And we, we need to um, think beyond functions. I mean, everybody in, in this workshop is, is, is reflecting on, on the payload that technology is also implementing. And by being aware of that, I, can, I believe that the systems that we will deploy into, into automotive cars in the future will be also aware of that because the people that design the systems bring the intelligence into it. That's fair, but uh, to be aware of the risk of a USB cable, <laughs> I didn't think about that really before. <laughs> really Interesting point. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Anyone more who wants to forward a question, please feel free to speak up. doesn't look like. So thank you very much, Philip. Thank you. Let me go to the next. Michael, your turn. You are the co-founder and the CTO of Saubellum in Israel. Uh, you joined the, uh, you worked at the Israel Defense Force. It looks like all the secu security companies in Israel are coming from a military background. And before you studied at the Open University of Israel. So it's your stage, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Engsler, and I'm the CTO of uh, Cybellum. And uh, today I'm going to talk with you about a, a new concept, a, a vision. Uh, that we see uh, uh, that will be able to introduce uh, full transparency from a cybersecurity perspective uh, to the automotive uh, supply chain. Click. Uh, but before we dive into the new vision and technology that uh, we're thinking about, I would like to share with you an interesting, interesting story. Um, this story is about a vulnerability called Ripple 20. Now, some of you might have heard of it and some of you might not, but I'm sure that if you didn't hear about Ripple 20, you heard about other famous vulnerabilities such as Blueborn, Heartbleed, and so on. And from time to time, uh, there is a, a famous vulnerability such as Ripple that is published and, and it's creating quite a lot of uh, havoc uh, in, in the industry and in a lot of other industries because of its uh, great impact. Uh, take, for example, this vulnerability. Uh, this vulnerability uh, has existed in a software library called Trek. Uh, and this software library uh, was published in a lot of devices worldwide. Uh, and that was the cause of the real problem and the big impact that this vulnerability had uh, worldwide. And, and the issue was that a lot of uh, device manufacturers, and this can be camera manufacturers, infotainment, steering wheels, smart TVs, and so on, have implemented this uh, library uh, named Trek, which was responsible for connectivity, for performing network operations. And, uh, um, and this library had a vulnerability. Uh, this vulnerability affected these devices and needed to be handled. Uh, and what I would like to show you now is a, a small case study of how 
uh, an OEM uh, have uh, treated this vulnerability uh, from the beginning of seeing this uh, news flash on uh, ZDNet until actually uh, issuing an uh, auto update to fix the vulnerability. Click. So um, once the OEM uh, has been aware that a new vulnerability has been uh, published online and, and is affecting a lot of uh, devices, uh, the first uh, stage that the uh, OEM did was to uh, do some type of impact analysis on all of the devices uh, that it is maintaining uh, with its vehicles. Uh, so it would, it would go over uh, the different types of devices, uh, let's say infotainment, and say, ah, infotainments, well, they are based on Android, and Android doesn't use TREC uh, because Android is a more uh, modern operating system, so that's not an issue for the infotainment. Uh, telematics also uses a different types of uh, operating system, let's say Linux, and is not affected. Uh, but the steering wheel and braking system, uh, wow, these are really low-level devices that there's a good chance that they might be implementing um, this specific library and might be vulnerable to Ripple 20. And one thing they finished this initial analysis uh, at home, uh, which took about one week, and uh, they had a list of devices that might be vulnerable to this vulnerability. And uh, they went to their suppliers, to the tier ones, uh, and to each one they uh, issued a request, uh, hey, uh, you supplied us this device, uh, we would like you to check if Ripple 20 is affecting it. Uh, and if it does, uh, we would like to know exactly how we can fix it. Um, the suppliers um, uh, started a, a, a rushing uh, process internally to try to see uh, what of their devices, and there's a lot of these devices, might be affected by this Ripple 20 vulnerability. And, and after a few weeks on, of investigations, uh, they came back to the OEM with, uh, uh, with a response that the uh, OEM didn't like so much. Um, and that response was, well, it depends. It depends how you deploy the device. It depends where it's located in the vehicle. It depends what is the configuration of the device. It depends on a lot of different factors. And these different factors would uh, eventually decide if the device is affected to the vulnerability, uh, but also not less important, the way of mitigation of or how to fix the vulnerability. And this back and forth between the OEM uh, and the supplier it took something like five to six weeks, uh, which eventually uh, created a list of vehicles, real VIN numbers, uh, if they are affected uh, to this Ripple 20 vulnerability and, and what uh, software update needs to be uh, published in order to fix it. Uh, the last stage was actually performing the over the update. Uh, and this is how the Ripple 20 saga uh, has been completed. And I think, what is interesting when you look at this specific example here is that this is one single vulnerability that caused the top management of both the OEMs and the tier one here to be involved. Uh, it took about five to six weeks uh, end to end in order to be able to uh, actually fix the vulnerable uh, vehicles on the road. Now, the problem is that five to six weeks for a single vulnerability is simply unscalable. And the main factor about that is that a typical IoT device has something ranging between five to 10 new vulnerabilities published every week that are affecting it. Not all of them are famous like Ripple 20, and that's why they did not get the attention like Ripple did. But nonetheless, there are a lot of new vulnerabilities and a solution is needed that is able to scale to handle all of these different types of issues. So um, maybe if we will recap a bit and try to understand how can it be that in 2021, uh, this is the way that uh, the automotive industry handles uh, vulnerabilities, uh, we will need to go back a bit in time and see what were the challenges in the past and compare them to now and then identify uh, why this is the current situation. Okay. So if uh, we go a few years back, let's say 10 years back, the challenges for cybersecurity for automotive were much smaller. And the reason is, first and foremost, there were a lot less issues. And the issues that did exist were pretty simple. They didn't have complex functionality and accordingly didn't have complex attack vectors. And I think the most important thing is that they were barely connected. 
And if you have a vehicle that is not connected to any cloud or to any external service, who cares if Ripple 20 is affecting it? Who cares if there's a hundred or a thousand vulnerabilities? If you need to come with your laptop and connect the USB in order to create an attack, well, that's not an issue that top management in an OEM or tier one would need to handle. But the challenges today are completely different. Today we have a dozen, sometimes even hundreds of ECUs per vehicle. They're really rich in functionality, not only the infotainment and, and telematics and the rich system, but also the smaller ones, because OBD done. <laughs> yeah, but also the, the smaller devices that are internally like braking system and so on have become much more complicated. And lastly, uh, they are all connected. And even if they're not connected directly, okay, let's say a steering wheel or a braking system, they, that steering wheel or braking system is connected directly to an infotainment system or to the CAN bus, and that system is connected directly to the cloud. So, so, so we have this very challenging situation today where the devices are more complicated and much more connected. Click. These challenges uh, are also uh, the cause of the consequences of the past and now. Uh, in the past, because it wasn't a real issue, there wasn't any relevant regulations. And uh, the efforts for, for fixing a vulnerability would be mainly manual efforts and that would be okay. Uh, you would periodically check some devices, some versions, you, you would create some fixes. It wouldn't be a, a big concern, but you would do a continuous manner here for, for always leveling up your cybersecurity, but not something that is a real issue. Um, and I think most importantly, uh, if you go 10 years back, um, there was not a lot of support for post-production uh, devices, uh, both because of the uh, um, uh, auto solutions that were available and also because of the low risk. Uh, but that is not the situation today. Uh, today, first and foremost, we can see the regulation coming in hard uh, with WP29 and the upcoming ISO. Uh, we can see also that uh, car manufacturers and their supplier are becoming more and more software uh, companies. Uh, done are the days where a new version is published uh, every half a year or so on. Today, most of these companies work in Agile. They provide a new version on a monthly or quarterly basis. Uh, with new features, new attack surface, and new potential vulnerabilities. Uh, and lastly, also continuous monitoring is something that uh, both car manufacturers and tier ones uh, are uh, not only uh, required by regulation, but is something that they have to do in order to exactly answer questions like Ripple 20. Uh, is a new vulnerability impacting one of my vehicles uh, or my entire fleet, and how can I, uh, how can I tackle that? Click. So given this, these new challenges that uh, our automotive cybersecurity industry is facing, and the biggest question that, that comes up uh, uh, first is, um, is something that we heard uh, a lot of times coming from the IT industry. And that is, how do I se secure something uh, that I don't understand? And, and, and taking the example of the IT network, if I have today, let's say security cameras in my network, but I don't know where they're located. I don't know what operating system they're running. I don't know anything about them. I just know that I have dozens of security cameras that are running and might be attacked. Uh, what chances do I have uh, to secure it? And, 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 and if again, we look at the IT industry, the first step that they did in order to protect devices or the unknown was first and foremost to gain visibility and transparency into these locations. And once you have this visibility and transparency, you can start creating cybersecurity actions uh, in order to strengthen your security. So what I would like to uh, propose now is the uh, vision or idea uh, that we have uh, thought about in Cybellum a few years ago of how to gain this visibility uh, in the complicated supply chains of automotive. So this vision is called a, a cyber digital twin. And so first and foremost, what is a cyber digital twin? A, a cyber digital twin is a digital replica of a real life device. And so for example, if a car manufacturer has an infotainment, telematics and braking system, it would have for each one of these devices, a matching cyber digital twin. 
And second, that cyber digital twin will contain all of the information that is required in order to perform cybersecurity operations. For example, information needed to perform vulnerability management, impact analysis, and so on. And lastly, um, the cyber digital twin must contain information in a manner that can be easily transferable and shareable across the supply chain. Because for example, uh, one might say, uh, okay, to perform cybersecurity operations, I need the entire source code of the device. But this is something that is unacceptable and it's something that uh, uh, the supply chain would simply not comply and not pass on because it's the core IP uh, of each one of the suppliers in the supply chain. So we need to find that sweet spot uh, that can on one hand, give us all the information that is needed to perform ongoing cybersecurity operations, but on the other hand, is not too sensitive so that the entire supply chain can share it with each other without the fear of loss of IP or anything like that. Click. Now let's imagine that we have this cyber digital twin. I wanna show you here how that twin is created or when is it created and how it supports the entire life cycle of the product and what is the value that we can gain if the cyber digital twin would have existed. And so the twin would actually be created on the very first phases of the, the design of the device before even a single line of code have been written. In this case, the OEM would create a cyber digital twin and start uploading information that would be relevant for uh, creating security operations in the future. Uh, for example, it would upload to the cyber digital twin all the security requirements. Security requirements of, uh, of an OEM can be uh, the device must run Bluetooth, but only from version 3.0 and above. Uh, the device must run Ubuntu, but only, only version uh, 20 and above, and so on. So these security uh, requirements would be the baseline for the cyber digital twin. Click. It would share the cyber di digital twin with the uh, tier one responsible for the development. And then uh, same as the OEM, the tier one would start uploading the information that is relevant uh, for the cyber digital twin. Uh, so for example, it would upload all the information regarding the firmware, soft, uh, such as its entire software bill of materials, meaning what packages and versions uh, they, they are adding to the device, uh, what is the general architecture of the device, uh, what is the uh, general policies of, for example, encryption keys, uh, what is the minimum bit lengths and stuff like that. All that would be added to the cyber digital twin and would later be used uh, to perform security operations. Click. Once uh, the uh, device would reach a, a maturity level of, let's say, a beta version, the next step would be a, a, the OEM adding its acceptance test. So uh, we already have it, the cyber digital twill, the original requirements. That is something that is kept since the initial design a few years ago. Now they, they would add on top of that what is accepted uh, uh, as accept, acceptance test, uh, test for the cybersecurity requirements that were previously uh, defined. Click. And lastly, um, remember in Ripple 20, all of the information that the OEM needed to add on each VIN number, like what is the specific configuration of that VIN, and uh, how was that VIN deployed and so on. Uh, and it was crucial as part of the investigation process to know what is affected uh, by Ripple or not. So instead of doing that each time you have a new vulnerability, that would be added uh, uh, again here, once the device is ready for deployment and deployed, we would take all of the information regarding a uh, specific vehicles, their configuration, their deployment parameters and so on, and add this on top to the cyber digital twin. As you can see, the final, uh, um, the final view of this object called the cyber digital twin is really all the information here that is required in order to perform a cybersecurity operations. And um, click. Going back, for example, to the Ripple 20 uh, 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 case study, if the OEM would have the cyber digital twin uh, created from the early phase with all the information, the entire investigation process that took five to six weeks would happen instantaneously. You could do that in a couple of seconds by just clicking 
cross-referencing what is the vulnerability, what is the software bill of material of a device, what is the configuration and parameters of deployment, and you will get immediately if the, if the vulnerability is affecting the device or not. And this would really bring a true scalability to be able to handle those five to 10 new vulnerabilities that are coming out every week to your devices and on the, not only to the famous ones that get to the news. Click. This would also give you much more transparency for every single vehicle. Imagine that an OEM could know for each VIN number, what is its full software bill of material? What each device is running, which operating system, what version, and what type of configuration and so on. This is the basic uh, foundations for transparency and visibility uh, that is required in order to perform a lot of complicated cybersecurity activities that can be later uh, put on top of that. Click. And lastly, um, if you have this cyber digital twin, you have a single location, a single truce where everything is located. And this can be shared with all the uh, collaborating members that have interest from a cybersecurity perspective on that device. Now, obviously it's the OEM and its supply chain, the tier one, tier two, and so on, uh, which we've just discussed during this uh, presentation. But it's not only that, uh, it's also, for example, MSSPs uh, or the auditor, uh, all, all the upcoming regulations such, such as W29 uh, require from OEMs to be able to provide for a device uh, the historical vulnerability management, uh, the decisions that we're uh, taking about specific uh, issues, uh, uh, tracking, traceability, comments, history, uh, all that would exist in a single location and could later be used to create uh, very quickly and efficiently reports for the auditor in order to comply with the upcoming uh, regulations. Click. So if I'll try to summarize here uh, this new concept that uh, we've thought about here in Cybellum, the main value that Cyber Digital Twin can bring you is visibility and transparency into your supply chain. And visibility and transparency is really uh, the basic uh, a fundamental need in order to perform cybersecurity on any assets. Once you properly understand your vehicles, once you properly understand the devices that are made out of that vehicle, you can build on top of that a lot of cybersecurity operations and services um, and do that in a scalable manner uh, that would fit uh, the automotive industry in 2021. Click. Uh, just shortly about Cybellum, uh, uh, I'll uh, close this presentation with a, a brief, brief explanation uh, about us. Uh, so Cybellum is an uh, automotive cybersecurity company uh, with a very single uh, dedicated mission. Uh, and that mission is to uh, enable OEMs and their suppliers to develop and maintain secure products. Click. We do that using two main products uh, that we provide for product security teams, uh, our uh, product security assessment product and product security operations, both for pre-SOP and post-SOP. Uh, and these two products are built upon our cyber digital twin platform, which is our private implementation for the core ideas and concept that I've presented during this uh, presentation. And using this Cyber Digital Twin platform and the products on top of it, uh, we're able to provide solutions such as vulnerability management throughout the entire product lifecycle, from design to develop, testing, uh, and later on continuous monitoring for uh, uh, new vulnerabilities and their impact on your fleet. Uh, we're able to uh, provide uh, the compliance and regulations uh, reports and processes that are required in order to uh, um, uh, comply with upcoming regulations such as type approval, WP29, ISO, and so on. Uh, and we're able to also uh, provide a solution for continuous monitoring and incidents response, uh, just uh, such as the example of the Ripple 20 uh, that I've started this presentation with. Click. So uh, that was a, a brief overview about this new concept, a uh, cyber digital twin. 
uh, that we truly believe in. Um, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. It was a pleasure. I love the call for transparency. Even so, I got my doubts after 40 years in the industry that uh, this is going to happen. That Max Turner from Isanovia, you got a remark maybe? Uh, can you speak out yourself, please? Not there anymore, looks like. Uh, the point was to put a, a OBD dongle with cellular connection to an existing car, which was never designed or tested uh, for any connection to the internet. What, hmm, what happens then? How do you implement it into your transparency uh, approach? Something which is only developed 10 years later. Yeah, so I, I think if, if I got that correct, that comment was, uh, it was said when I was introducing the connectivity of uh, how today, uh, even internal devices such as a braking system and steering wheel, which don't have a direct connection uh, to the internet might get this uh, connectivity through uh, a different device, such as uh, an OBD dongle with a cellular Wi-Fi or an infotainment that is connected directly if I got that uh, comment uh, correctly. Well, the, the point is that this car, the system was never designed for direct, directly being connected to whatever in the internet. So how do you put it into your testing strategy, into your transparency energy? Uh, even so, who is responsible for such kind of thing? Is it allowed? Many questions coming up. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Let's move on to the next. The next is IMTS. Eddie as the head of strategy from Cybellum, but in this case, he's speaking as the responsible guy to set up the cyber security activities from IMTS. And his co-speaker is going to be Hermann Brandt. He is the co-chairman of IMTS, the Technical Leadership Committee. I think who's going to start, Eddie? Your turn. No, I will. So okay, so is the wrong way around. <laughs> no, no problem. Thank you, Alex, for the kind introduction. So I will start uh, to introduce you to IAMTS. IAMTS. Uh, stands for in the International Alliance for Mobility Testing and Standardization. And uh, I want to clarify from the very beginning, it's not a standard setting organization, like for example, IEEE SA or also ISO, but uh, IAMTS makes heavily use of standards and also identifies standardization gaps. But, but before coming, to more details about IMTS, I'll, I'll give you, I wanted to give you a, 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 a bit of the background of the problem space. And uh, so I will then later on for, the, for the, the last part of the presentation hand over to Eddie, who will then talk about a new working group of IAMTS. Next slide, please. Yeah, we have, we have um, seen this already today, the transformation of mobility. So um, there is no need anymore today to elaborate on that. Uh, just wanted to say, so this transformation is of course driven by, industry, by uh, information and communication technologies. Computer, computerization and softwareization. It uh, well, it's it it's a, a transition from us as drivers to being operators and eventually passengers of cars. It's about uh, um, cars being not anymore standalone products, but uh, being part of a very complex uh, yeah, mobility ecosystem. This is all uh, due to more microelectronics, more computing power, 
more and more software defined functionality in cars. And of course, this goes with, uh, due to the connectivity and also uh, co more communication interfaces, uh, a, a large variety of software functions. It goes with many new interfaces, dependencies, which means that uh, the traditional, the legacy approach to do validation, uh, once uh, have a type approval at the beginning and then periodic inspections, it doesn't work anymore. It has to be a hybrid continuous approach uh, because uh, yeah, cybersecurity risks and uh, attacks may happen all the time. Next slide, please. Yeah, the, we, we know that um, technologies, they develop fast. Innovation cycles of ICT are very short and uh, there are new business opportunities coming up and there are emerging new markets. But the problem is uh, the regulatory environment, the regula regulation as such as a process, a, a cooperative process is slow. And so th the challenge for a company is how to manage time to market of much more complex products and services while meeting the moving target of different regulatory requirements. So how to bridge this gap between uh, fast technology development and slow regulation. Next slide, please. There seems to be rough consensus in the automotive industry that the sort of integrated approach for AV validation uh, is needed. So here you see the example of the International Organization of Car Manufacturers. They call it the three pillar approach. And you see it's uh, an integrated approach from the bottom to the top in the sense that uh, it's a combination of simulations at different levels combined with the process audits and assessments, but then also includes physical certification tests, either as a vehicle in the loop testing or on proving grounds. And eventually on the top, you see the real world test drive on public roads. Uh, this, is, this is all uh, looks good. Next slide, please. This seems reasonable, but uh, like very often, uh, uh, the devil is in the detail and you see uh, the option space uh, for testing to, uh, to prepare for certification in support of various uh, regulatory environments. The, the option space is huge. There are, so, and the basic question is what to test and how to test and there are many differences in, in practices in, in, in different regions in the world. And these differences are related to traffic rules, road types, environmental conditions, infrastructures and the like. But not only that, it's also about testing licenses, different regimes to, to get such a testing license test area accessibility and all the practices of reporting, data analysis, including data privacy, the challenge of simulation fidelity, test data portability and compatibility, and, and in general, comparability and replicability of tests across test beds. So individual companies are completely lost in this space. Uh, they, they can't manage the uncertainty related to that alone. Uh, so a global approach is needed and, and a global co collaboration is a must. This is why IMTS 
actually was founded. The next slide, please. Again, IMTS stands for the International Alliance for Mobility Testing and Standardization. It is, it is all about uh, global uh, cooperation, global cooperation and globally harmonizing industry practices to get ready for validation of AV, so the focus is on uh, level three, level four, and eventually also level five, of course, to get ready for validation, validation in support of certification under various regulatory environments. Next slide, please. The belief is that uh, that. Uh, testing in a closed environment uh, doesn't work anymore. So uh, the IMTS vision actually is to create a global community comprised of advanced mobility testing service providers and companies, organizations and agencies in need of such a service. So bringing together supply and demand to develop and share best practices to enable consistent, replic replicable and re reliable testing. To maintain a global directory of physical, virtual and cyber physical test beds. And in general, to support global harmonization of standards and certification to ensure the timely deployment of advanced mobility systems and services. Next slide, please. The founding members of IMTS are uh, from Europe, TÜV Süd, from China. I just mentioned, yeah, from China, the Qatar, which means uh, the China Automotive Technology and Research Center. And uh, from the US, ITIC, the International Transportation and Innovation Center. So uh, IAMTS was originally set up as a, uh, under the SAE uh, ITC program, but um, has decided to be an independent legal entity and is in, in a transition to be set up as, a, as its own legal entity. Next slide, please. The organizational structure is quite simple. There is an executive committee, there is a technical leadership committee, and for the time being there are three working groups, and uh, Eddie will talk about a fourth working group soon. Uh, so these, these three already established working groups, uh, they are regarded as sort of competence centers and specific technical or engineering domains. So the first one on test scenario definition and harmonization, second one on test bed capabilities and assessment, and third one on, on integrated physical virtual testing. The next slide, please. Let me give you an idea about uh, the current focus of these three working groups. So working group one yeah, tries to answer the two questions, what and how to test for validation and certification. So they actually look into use cases like uh, highways, traffic uh, driving, uh, self-driving on highway, highways or in cities, break it down into traffic scenarios, break it down into test scenarios. And uh, then also thinking about the variations of parameters needed. And of course, uh, ideally these test scenarios should be in a database. There should be a, a standardized way to describe them. So using, for example, the uh, scenario definition language. And of course, it's also about uh, thinking about what can be done uh, 
uh, with tests based on simulations on what has to be done physically. The second working group currently uh, looks into proving grounds. So, and as a first step to, uh, yeah, first step to identify those proving grounds from all over the world, then uh, collecting some basic information, but then also thinking about uh, capability sets needed for specific tests and validation. And the next step also to think about uh, um, validation or assessing such uh, capability sets and thus proving ground. The last one is all about, for the time being, virtual testing uh, as an enabler or actually as a mandatory tool for approval and validation. And so this is about how to tightly uh, couple the physical and, and virtual reality and also to develop criteria to validate the entire simulation or simulation-based testing tool chain. Next slide, please. Yeah, with that, I would like to hand over to Eddie. Eddie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Herman. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, so, hi everyone. Very nice to meet you. I'm Eddie. Eddie Lazevnik. I'm uh, leading leading the global partnerships in Cybello, but here I'm actually at the, at the head of leading the working group for of yes. So, I think that now it's a, actually a short poll time. Uh, Christina or Axel, can you? I would really appreciate if you could answer these three questions. Um, Christina or someone, the moment you have some results, it would be great if you could share it with us. Sure, Eddie. Uh, so far, I have seven responses. I'm just going to give it another 10 seconds and then I'll show the results. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, uh, so as you all see, the results are uh, are showing um, quite in a clear way, in a definitive way that um, the regulation is here and it's something that all of us are bothered about and should be bothered about and that there is plenty of work to be done in order to understand what is actually should be done and how it uh, has to be done. So next slide, please. Next slide, next slide, please. Perfect. So uh, uh, diving into working group four of IMTS, we identified uh, several challenges. And as you have seen, uh, there is uh, the, the known challenge is the regulation of WP29, the UNEC, and the fact that is there is no clear way about how to test it, how to certify it, and what has to be done. So, um, so let me bring some bad news. Uh, WP29 is just one, or maybe the most famous regulation activity about um, automotive cybersecurity. There are many more. Uh, in China, in, in the States, there is a, a huge uh, change in paradigm by having the NISA uh, guidelines in, and and even in Singapore, there are some uh, technical reference which are uh, standards and regulation requirements. 
uh, about cybersecurity for uh, automotive and autom autonomous vehicles. So regulation requirements and regulation landscape is changing rapidly and, uh, ch and cybersecurity for automotive coming to be quite a huge challenge that all of us and all of the entire industry has to be very minded of. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, another challenge that IMTS is aware of, and that's actually the amount and the differentiation uh, between the stakeholders that are active in that domain of testing and certification and qualification of cyber uh, security regulation. So of course, um, so of course, we have the stakeholders of OEMs and tiers, and and of course uh, the two providers. But on the other hand, there are the regulatory bodies and uh, testing organizations like uh, the two suits of the world and the proving grounds, which are very uh, active in IMTS and others. So the challenge here is actually that each of them has a bit different perspective, a bit different agenda and a bit different understanding of how these regulations that I mentioned in the previous slide should be certified, should be tested. And each of them has his own best practices to analyze and to understand this changing domain of automotive cybersecurity. Next slide, please. And here is actually what we are aiming to do in working group four in IMTS. As Herman presented before me, IMTS is a global organization or alliance of organizations. We have representation all the way from Korea, China, in Asia, and uh, to Europe, uh, through Israel, of course, uh, and all the way to, to the States. We have the composure of people in organization is, is very unique. It talks about, it's very testing oriented by having uh, TSC institutes like Tufsud uh, and Qatar. It is a, a Acad academia institutes like the uh, like uh, Tallinn Technicum and Florida Tech and many more and many others uh, standardization organizations like IEEE and SAE and and of course many more. So having the composure of testing oriented institutes, uh, testing aut automotive testing uh, institutes, uh, cybersecurity perspective and the global coverage. It's quite unique and very, very special and very required right now to have such a global harmonized alliance to understand how stuff should be done and how, it's, how it is being done right now in the very near future and how we envision the certification and testing of automotive cybersecurity to be done in, in, the, in the years to come. So that's something that is very unique about MTS. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what is the opportunity what we are, or what we are aiming to do here? So IMTS and Working Group 4, the opportunity is tremendous. What we are trying to do here is actually to set the bar or actually to qualify a benchmark about how cybersecurity testing is done. We're gonna begin with evaluating and understanding and mapping what are the best practices as of right now uh, that is, are conducted by TIC Institute, by test uh, bed, by proving grounds. We're gonna map all the uh, um, guidelines that are out there right now and what is uh, required or what is uh, suggested. And eventually we believe that in the, in the very near future, we will be able to provide what are the our understanding about what is being done and actually being able to, after a common analysis, and the global presence of, uh, of the organizations around the table able to come with the best practices and guidelines about how automotive cybersecurity testing should be conducted. So that's the opportunity and that's uh, the claim to fame and that's where we are aiming for. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the very first project, uh, uh, it's actually to understand the best practices and the strategy of testing cybersecurity, automotive cybersecurity among uh, these three axes. 
there is an access of different organizations and which and which of the, each of them has his own agenda and his own perspective on the regulation uh, the other part is the geography uh, the in some of them type approval is required in some others it's self-regulated and self-approved and in others uh, in china for example they have their local regulations and others so actually being able to cover uh, to harmonize the global uh, requirements and global differentiations and the third axis is actually the regulatory landscape uh, which is quite different and but very much inspired by WP29 or, or driven by WP29. So the very first project that we are aiming is actually to map the existing best practices. And afterwards, we are, we, uh, we are moving forward to analyze and to find the commonalities and differentiations and to hopefully uh, the very holy grail is actually to be able to provide guidelines or harmonized uh, best practices for how how it should be done. Next slide, please. So, so coming back to what uh, mm -hmm, Herman presented beforehand. So uh, <clears throat> IMTS has currently three working groups. The, the first one is actually about, uh, is about uh, best practices. Another one is about uh, test beds and the third about simulation. So we believe that uh, working group for the cybersecurity testing will be will get inputs from all of them by actually being able to get the best uh, the test beds information and then test beds best practices and getting the testing uh, repository from the TIC institutes. So we are we are aiming to get inputs from them and to analyze them all and come back with inputs to them after our analysis. So that's, so if there is an internal feedback in order to make working group for not only based on the out, out the world, but actually to be inspired and to be um, enlarged by the internal communication with the IMTS, other working groups and the personnel that is included there. So with that, um, aspiration and motivation of having harmonized, globalized uh, best practices uh, for cybersecurity, uh, automatic cybersecurity testing. That's what we are aiming to do in working group four in IMTS. Next slide. That's actually what IMTS is about. And cybersecurity is very much, of course, part of that and very much uh, relevant right now in, in, in the automotive domain uh, is a very appealing uh, pillar for that uh, testimony. Next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so I hope that we were able to convey a bit about or to share a bit about MTS and what we are about and what about a working group four is about. And in case you would like to join the opportunity and to join our journey to understand how testing is done right now and to be able to set the tone about how it should be done. So by all means, reach out to me, that's my email or uh, to any other IMTS member. And uh, it would be great to, to have you on board and to hear your feedbacks and to, you know, to have more participants in that journey. Thank you very much, Shaman and Eddie. There are no questions from the audience, at least not on the chat system yet. So anyone would like to, who would like to forward a question, please, from the audience, feel free. Ah, yeah. Stefan, ah, yeah. <laughs> are non-members allowed to contribute? Okay, Eddie and Herman, you know the answer on that. I will let Herman to answer, please. Alan, you have to switch on your mic. Oh, sorry, I was I was muted. The, yeah, there the, of course. Uh, IMTS it's it's a member driven basically it's a member driven organization. 
But of course, there are, so we thought about opportunities also for non-members to make contributions. So when there is a process in place to do that and how to do that. And uh, it has uh, to be decided case by case, but the answer is yes, it's possible. Okay. Uh, you, you know, of course, I like very much this idea of global approach. And with Katak, you have the China world, at least from the top, implemented. Uh, but there are, I, I see, I didn't, at least I couldn't identify any uh, Chinese company. Uh, is there anything going to come to integrate Chinese companies as well, like Huawei or whatever? Yeah, so yeah, uh, the answer is uh, getting more Chinese uh, representation is uh, an action item on one of the uh, founding members of uh, IMTS, and he's very active about that. So I believe that there are more organizations from China and from the States to join. So yeah, the answer is uh, the list of the members is increasing every time. I had about seven versions of these slides and every time there was another new name, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like the increase of membership, of course, yes. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Doesn't look like. So then let's go to last but not least, Stefan. Stefan <coughs> is a senior technology scout for cybersecurity issues at AVL. He studied, uh, or he worked, sorry, at the Ioanneum Research Center as a key researcher on cybersecurity. So he really should understand the issue. And uh, Campus O2, is that a university of, uh, I don't know, Stefan, enlighten us. The stage is yours. Yeah, it's, an, it's a university of applied science. Um, sorry, I okay. have to start my video as well. Um, Thanks for having us. I think we are quite um, in time. Um, first off, um, I want to catch up a little on Eddie um, because um, we are also members in the IMTS group. And I want to strongly advertise um, to join this group because um, we are doing really um, well fun things there to well, harmonize efforts um, in creating better, um, well, best practices um, for cybersecurity testing. And the more members we have, um, the better it is uh, actually. Um, but what I want to talk to you today is uh, about the structured approach uh, to automotive cybersecurity testing. Um, this is something we have developed um, also like I think one of my pre-speakers in a um, European funded project, because um, we have found that there is not much of a structured approach quite yet. Um, this is also uh, a topic for the IMTS uh, cybersecurity group, by the way. Uh, but first off, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about how, uh, about our findings here. So please go to the next slide. So as you have already heard a couple of times, um, first off, we uh, postulate that um, automotive systems are insecure by default because um, they are complex systems. And within complex systems, you always will find something, um, some footholds that you can um, use to leverage your cyber attack, basically. The, key thing here is to make that attack so, um, well, hard to do um, that no one would actually, um, well, um, do the effort to attack your system. That's basically it. Um, of course, um, to do so, you would need proper cybersecurity engineering. And um, also you want to um, make sure that your, um, well, safeguards that are in place to prevent uh, such attacks um, are actually functioning. So thing is, you've already heard a little bit about that before. Um, 
the UNISI regulation and the ISO standards um, are more or less mandating um, that you do um, proper cybersecurity engineering. Next slide, please. So as for the regulation and the standard, I will just um, go through that a little bit quicker because you've already heard it. Um, the punchline, which you also already heard today, um, is that you will have to do uh, proper cybersecurity engineering um, to your automotive systems. Otherwise, you won't sell um, any new um, car models in the EU. Uh, beginning 2022 and none at all beginning 2024. So that's um, the main issue here. And therefore um, you don't only need to um, make your cars more secure, but you also have to prove it. And by, proof, uh, by proving it, it means basically testing. However, um, the NISI is not quite sure on how to do things. Um, the UNICE just more or less um, prescribes that you have to do something. And the ISO standard is a little bit more elaborate on how, um, but this how is also more on a, well, let's say um, a high level. And also um, the ISO standard doesn't say much about testing. It um, says only, well, there are um, a certain amount of categories of testing like pen testing and um, interface testing and stuff like that, but not much more. Um, this has already been seen um, that uh, the specifications there are not sufficient. So therefore there is a new working group um, that delivers um, sort of um, testing guidelines um, as a supplement to ISO 21434. Um, however, this group has um, more or less just started and um, I think results um, will not be due so soon. Therefore, um, we have seen the need of a, well, let's say more or less comprehensive testing process um, for automotive systems that spans over the whole life cycle and covers cybersecurity testing. Next slide, please. So, of course, the crucial thing is that by now, um, testing the cybersecurity of automotive systems is mainly done manu manually, um, which means that you would hire um, a couple of experts and they would either um, get in a white box test a list of specifications and go through them, or um, they do a black box test where they um, do a, well, let's say just um, do as you can and try to break into my system. Um, problem is, of course, um, especially the second approach is very, very tedious and time consuming in terms of that it um, would require a lot of resources, a lot of knowledge, and also um, you will have to imagine that you would uh, have to dig into systems, reverse engineer stuff and um, other things like that. And that of course, um, again, consumes a lot of time and money. And also um, it's more art than craft, so to speak, which means that the um, results of these tests are not, well, let's say easily reproducible. Um, and also um, they maybe say more about the tester than about the tested system. Next slide, please. And again, click please. So what we are proposing actually is to make um, the whole process a little bit more formal. This way we could um, not only get gain a little bit of efficiency because um, we don't have to do uh, everything anew um, and thus of course cost reductions um, and um, time to market. 
but also, of course, um, more reproducible tests in terms of, well, um, the test should more or less look like the same for any system on the test, of course. So therefore, um, we were looking for ways to um, have a systematic testing approach and also some approach that um, allows for automating parts of it. Um, I say um, deliberately parts of it because um, there are always are parts that have to be done manually. If you want to really break into a system, um, at some point you would need to do reverse engineering or stuff like that, that is not so easily to be um, automated. Um, but of course we were searching for the points that can be automated um, and um, to, well, basically do that so that the highly paid experts who really know what they are doing uh, can concentrate on the stuff that um, is not, well, let's say it plainly boring for them. So in principle, um, we defined uh, eight activities. Um, um, all in all in the process, we pretty much aligned with ISO 21434 where it's um, possible and where um, it was sort of fit because of course um, the ISO um, more describes um, the engineering process and the testing is a bit different, but somehow of course um, related. Um, so the first activity um, is defined item, which means in, in that instance, um, defining um, more or less the scope of testing. But um, for, for the overall process, um, I'm aware that the diagram looks a little bit complicated when just um, having a look on it um, on a short, well, a short period of time here. Um, for the diagram, of course, um, we have a paper, which uh, you can, of course, obtain um, if you write me an email or stuff like that. Um, and uh, for the other activities, I will go um, down in a bit more of detail um, at the next slides. Um, just for you, um, we basically um, grouped it um, into three um, more or less parts here which um, the first is um, the upper part um, um, above the big box, which is more or less the prerequisites part. Then um, at beginning at point four, um, we are planning the actual test and the lower part uh, below um, the big box um, at number four um, is more or less the execution part. Um, next slide, please. One concept that's in there is also um, that we um, were um, abstracting test patterns um, in order um, to reuse tests and to make tests um, between different STTs more comparable. Um, this um, abstracting just means that um, within test planning, um, we are defining um, steps that are actually be, to be taken to um, more or less um, attack successfully an SUT um, on a whole level. So um, in this case, we are talking about, well, say an ECU or uh, a whole car as a system. Um, this uh, process should be uh, so versatile that um, it's applicable uh, to any scale of automotive system. And the test patterns uh, then are described um, in an abstract way, um, which means that they are, um, well, contain what's um, to be done when attacking a system, but without mentioning any of the system's details, which means um, that um, you would, for instance, um, describe um, that you would, for if you have a full car, you want to attack, attack, 
you would uh, describe that you would use a Bluetooth vulnerability to get onto the infotainment system. And when getting hold of the infotainment system, you would issue uh, some commands that would um, allow you for um, a privileged escalation. And uh, from that, you maybe have access to the CAN bus and set up a certain CAN message. But it, all of these steps I just described would be test patterns. Um, and they are described in a way um, that they are agnostic to the system under test. For instance, if you want to, well, go to issue a break signal onto the CAN bus, that's actually what you write into the test pattern. And only later on um, in the test case generation, um, this pattern would then be, um, well, um, fused with uh, the actual system and the test information, which would in that case be um, the CAN message that would uh, stand for break signal um, in the very system under test. And that, um, well, that way you would have a, a chain of steps to be taken. And in their concretization, they form the actual test case for the system under test. Um, next slide, please. So as said before, the upper steps are the actions to prepare a test. So define item in our case, again, does not mean to define um, the complete system on the test as a whole, but in a nutshell, only um, the parts that are to be tested. So basically you define the testing scope, you define the functions that are actually tested, but of course, um, nothing that is outside of the testing scope. So um, that is um, the uh, difference to um, defining items in the security process. Also, of course, um, we have um, inserted um, some sort of uh, risk analysis, um, which um, could even be um, derived or the same like done in the um, engineering, in the parallel engineering process. Um, but um, the purpose here is that you would uh, come to um, safeguards you would expect to be in place um, that you then can actually test for. So um, here um, we just um, see the risk analysis of the preparative action for um, the next part, the uh, security concept, um, which basically um, defines the targets what you test uh, against basically, because um, again, you would um, see some weak points, of course, um, maybe you already uh, on a concept level discover some vulnerabilities. Um, and of course you um, will, um, well, identify um, protective measures to be in place. And that's actually um, what's in your security concept that you want to be tested again. Um, like in the other parts here, the security concept um, is um, meant to be in the context of a test catalog and not um, in, in the context of, a, um, of an engineering, um, well, let's say um, practice what you want to do. Um, next slide, please. So um, more or less the heart of um, the process is the test planning here. Um, we, um, as I already said before, uh, there we would create a uh, test scenario. And this test scenario is in principle a concatenation of um, the test patterns I mentioned before. So, um, the um, test scenario um, wants to, well, create a realistic um, scenario that uh, could uh, occur in the wild as well. Um, but again, said um, on an abstract level. Um, so this means that um, you would just um, 
well, describe the steps, um, what you want to do um, or you, you want to test when breaking into the system and then you do the next step and so on. But this is more or less how you would imagine an attack. Um, click, please. Um, could you click, sorry. Okay, um, there was one um, graph missing, uh, one, one image missing in the last slide, but doesn't matter. Um, and what, what was missing in the last slide was um, an example we ac actually implemented um, from a domain specific language um, that you would um, describe the attacks there. This again is just on, a, uh, on an abstract level, basically. Um, in the next steps, um, you would basically um, select um, test scripts um, that would match those test patterns. For instance, um, if one of the test patterns say to issue a certain message on the canvas, um, the um, actual test script would be an executable version. Um, um, of this test pattern and executable in that case, um, well, automatically, of course, means that you would have to know which systems on, uh, system on the test you have in front of you. So if your system on the test is a cheap, for instance, you would have to um, somehow um, know if, again, for the example, the test pattern includes issuing a break signal. Um, you would have to know what um, this uh, or how this um, break signal exactly looks like on the canvas on a Jeep. Um, and if you're test testing a BMW, of course, that can message would look completely different. And therefore, you would have to know uh, what it looks like there. So. Um, this is basically the purpose of the script selection here. This could also include, um, of course, as we have more and more IT technology in cars, um, well, exploits from an exploit database, for instance, um, an exploit that would um, issue a blueborn attack um, onto an infotainment system that's running on Android or something like that. So um, as you see here in the slide, um, I'm talking about really concrete um, and executable versions um, of those test patterns. And the test case generation um, has the uh, job or the purpose of selecting those scripts and generating a test case out of it. That again would um, be the concrete version of such a test scenario I was talking about before. Um, what you can see here on the slides, on, on the right slide, is um, also from from our proof of concept um, that you uh, some some well code snippet that would resemble um, a concretization of such an attack. Um, well, next slide, please. Uh, okay, there is the animation in. Um, it's just saying that you would, in our example here, um, have the victim's um, computer go to an infotainment system of a car, and via the CAN, um, you you um, issue an, in our case, an arbitrary signal um, onto the CAN of the uh, victim um, car, basically. Um, click, please. I think there is one more animation. Yes, um, and to the next slide, please. Yes, and then um, in the process, we are as far as already um, having a proper test case. Of course, what I forget to mention are uh, some sub steps within uh, the activities I've just mentioned before. For instance, um, if you don't ha have a proper um, executable script ready to um, form your test cases, you of course have to create them or obtain them um, through some other means, which could be exploit databases or something like that. And um, another sub step that will 
have to be executed when um, creating your own scripts or obtaining them. Um, we'll be validating those test scripts as well. Um, of course, uh, as you would do that with, um, well, crash and expected outcome on a system, you know they would work, of course, obviously. So um, then you have a proper test case, case and um, next step, of course, is just um, executing on the system on the test, which of course um, includes also um, some preparative actions uh, regarding the testing environment, which means um, also that you uh, would at least it's not always possible in testing, but um, try to um, have a means to reestablish the clean state, so to speak, um, which is um, the state before the test, because at some, well, particular tests, um, it could be necessary, for instance, to flash is used um, inside your car uh, or, um, well, just uh, flash a, um, a compromised version of an operating system or firmware onto your infotainment system or some other chips. So um, this uh, should also be bear in mind and therefore um, it's part of our process here. And the last step of course is um, to generate a test report. Um, of course, those test pattern or um, and the, the concretization of those test patterns, uh, those scripts, um, are meant to be executed in a modular way, which means that um, when having a scenario in mind for a, well, if you will, a complete hack through of a car, um, then if you would fail at the first um, step um, when going through the infotainment, for instance, and you uh, just discover that your infotainment system is secure, then you would of course continue with the other steps just if the first step would have been successful. Um, and for that, of course, you would also have to prepare the environment properly, which means that you're not only going via Bluetooth, Wi-Fi or whatever interface, um, but you would also have to wire your test system um, directly on the CAN or on the OBD um, interface or whatever um, interface you have available, um, just to be able to continue with the next, next steps. And in the pre report, of course, um, having failed at the first step would mean that the SUD um, would have passed the first step, um, but still you want to um, continue with the subsequent steps. Um, next slide, please. So um, parallel to the process within the project, um, we developed a framework that um, well supports or facilitates uh, the application of the process. So um, also some of the screenshots um, you've seen um, are from a uh, well a proof of concept implementation. Um, in principle, um, our um, concept of a framework um, consists of a core, which is the big blue box um, in more or less the middle, um, which again uh, consists of the test case generation that is exactly responsible for the thing I've told you before, which is um, the fusion of uh, system under test um, information with uh, the abstract um, test patterns. Um, an attack execution engine, which is on the uh, lower left of the big blue box, um, that takes um, the instructions from the test case generation or the test case, if you will, um, and actually fires it onto the system on the test. Um, then you have a test oracle that uh, collects feedback from um, the SUT itself um, by reading it uh, when it stands on a test bed or something like that, or directly um, listening to uh, the canvas. And also, of course, to the execution engine, because the tools um, you will be using, like for sending CAN messages or for attacking um, wireless interfaces, will also provide feedback that um, um, then uh, will 
be um, analyzed by the Oracle. Um, in our case, um, it's more or less a rule-based system um, and then delivers um, the test results um, to the orchestration, which um, basically it's on the uh, lower right of the big box, uh, basically consists of, um, well, the user interface and the workflow uh, control engine, basically. Okay, and the rest of it is um, in principle um, sources where the tests come from and um, interfaces for the SUT. Also, we imagine, of course, um, that uh, the interfaces are not only traditional deskbed interfaces, um, but that could also be um, model in a loop interfaces, uh, things like that, because um, it's in our point of view, it's crucial to uh, do the testing over the whole life cycle and not only uh, when you have a, well, basically finished car, um, but um, to be able to do this sort of testing early in the development process. Um, again, here a little bit, um, the loop is closing to the beginning, to the item definition. When um, doing the item definition in the security engineering uh, for um, a new car or whatever, um, then, um, this item definition should input the item definition of the testing process. And maybe there could all already be a model um, that could be tested. Of course, um, this at this stage would be rudimentary, um, but um, clinching in the testing process at this early stage um, would of course um, discover uh, architectural flaws uh, pretty early and thus, of course, save money because we all know that, um, well, the later um, you fix a security flaw, the more expensive it gets, basically. Um, next slide, please. So I think, yes, I have already mentioned that on the last slide, that's um, the Testing is crucial over the whole life cycle. Of course, um, we are also thinking this process on being, um, well, um, applied continuously um, also to over the air updates and stuff like that to have the uh, so-called uh, tail of the V model also covered. So that's um, the security testing accompanies the, um, complete security engineering from the beginning uh, of the concepts until the end of life of the product. So I think that was already the last slide and um, please next slide. Ah, the conclusion is just um, that we want our process to facilitate um, automating um, cybersecurity testing um, by predefining those abstract patterns and transferring them to different system on the test um, in a uh, machine readable form. So that's um, the crucial tasks that really can't be automated um, are the only tasks that remain on the hands of the experts and the rest, all of the boring stuff should be done by machine. Of course, we want um, to uh, be the tests um, this way also comparable. Um, of course, um, think of authorities, they want to test a, a Japanese car the same way as they want to test a German or American car or whatever. And the last thing is, of course, efficiency, because it would offload a lot of manual testing and make um, the cybersecurity testing, therefore, um, more comprehensive, but still faster and cheaper. Um, next slide, please. So I think um, that leaves a little bit of time for Q&A, and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Stefan. Any question from the audience? I don't see any on the chat. Okay. And just a question from my point of view, you, you mentioned, uh, yeah, of, of course, I understand automation makes it comparable, efficient, and so on and so on. But 
how do you elaborate on, let's say, the testing genius, uh, the engineer who really knows where the loopholes, where the problems are? Uh, you can't, at least I can't imagine to train a machine, so to say, uh, to apply this kind of ingenie ingenious uh, uh, ideas when an engineer just thinks, oh, this must be the hole in the system. What, what never appeared before, because you can into an automated system, you can only implement what you did experience before already. Is that right? Or are you going to be able to implement something like a testing genius as well in future? <laughs> um, certainly a genius would be far, far away, <laughs> but um, there are two approaches. Um, the one is just to, well, um, try to, what I've just said, try to abstract and therefore um, use things that have already been done on certain systems and transfer them mm -hmm. to other systems. Um, that is something such a genius um, has already developed and we just try to apply to, to other things. And the second thing is, to use um, the, in my opinion, only real advantage of machines um, over humans, which is, um, well, they are faster because they don't think actually. And um, therefore um, we think of approaches of uh, applying uh, things like automatic learning to learn a model of a system on the test and then use model checking by, um, well, elaborate all the uh, possible paths uh, through a system and out of that um, create test cases that, um, well, uh, find the interesting edge cases where your system could break. I understand. Of course, the, the genius uh, will forget to test all the repeatable things. So um, in the end, I'm fully behind automated testing, of course, 100%. Yes, Thank you very sure. much. Of course, just just um, in the end, um, you cannot um, completely replace the genius, and there will always be the need for highly skilled experts. Yeah. Well, that's clear. Yeah, that's my understanding as well. Right. Reverse engineering, you started with that, is a difficult thing. This is basically, uh, it comes together. There's a genius uh, who is capable to do some re reverse engineering without going into the last detail, uh, because that would be too expensive. He has to get the idea where the problem may, may be. Right? Yep, okay. certainly. Good, okay, we are there coming is, to the end. There is survive. one question in the chat. Oh, sorry, yeah. Mikael Hoek, oh, that's a name, Hagloff, Hagloff. Yes, uh, that's perfect. You speak out on yourself, <laughs> yes. please. I, I'm just uh, have a little curious question. If you uh, regarding these uh, demands and so on, and uh, ISO 21434, if you see any relation uh, or if we see any scheme in the Cybersecurity Act coming through for certification in this area and testing and so on. Okay, I. I, um, maybe, maybe there are um, people uh, more adept to answer this question. So um, just from my point of view, um, I don't think so right now. I mean, of course, ENISA is also um, monitoring and doing a lot of um, good work inside automotive cybersecurity. Um, but um, right now, I would say that the UNISI scheme um, already stands for itself because um, it's more or less a European regulation where just um, Japan and Korea uh, appended themselves to it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we are going to finish this now. You survived it, quite a long thing. Next will be, yeah, this is just to repeat what is the idea of this whole event. And as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we would like to see your contribution. 
uh, we would like to get ideas we would like to get whatever you uh, our audience what you feel what should be discussed within the industry uh, the idea is to identify problems whatever which may be solved later on by standardization but we are not the standardization group we are a discussion group to identify problems issues for future to be discussed in more detail uh, for you whatever is triggering your interest so if in case you have any ideas any request you see two email addresses either contact myself or the IEEE and we are going to make a plan whatever it's going to be uh, there will be a next workshop there is nothing set up yet but we will see our web webinar uh, we will see whenever that is appropriate and please forward ideas Christina, I think we have a poll here as well. Can you just switch that on? So in the end, we would like to know, are you satisfied with us? Uh, so just uh, put your ideas. Are you satisfied with the, with the speakers, with the items we did uh, put forward? Uh, and maybe even more more is the quality are you uh, satisfied with our quality and uh, whenever you have any ideas please forward your ideas okay it's not possible on this final survey uh, but then put it forward on our email addresses please so let's see are uh, some answers coming in uh, how much time does it take, Christina? Ah, wow, very satisfied, looks good. Wow, we have none dissatisfied or very dissatisfied, that's good. Thank you very much. And Christina, can you go down to see the quality looks like or do I have to do that on my own ah yes I can do that wow very satisfied satisfied on the quality of the content I am positively impressed thank you very much to the audience so most important I can only repeat please your contribution is missing whatever you want to forward in terms of autonomous driving under the umbrella of trustworthiness uh, whatever you feel there should be further discussion and from my point of view specifically in the global aspect because that is what i really believe in uh, to bring the world together asia europe americas uh, so that the, our life will be as yeah easy <laughs> as possible uh, so that the automotive industry doesn't need to imp implement different measures and different norms and standards in the different regions of this world. Thank you very much for attending. I think it was a long morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And excuse us, please, for the mm, not optimal timing, because here today it was Chinese New Year. So most presumably we missed lots of contributions and ideas from China. And in Israel, it's Sabbath, also not really the perfect timing. Excuse me, Eddie and all the people in Israel. Uh, next time we will do better. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you. Bye-bye. Thank you.